you look at the midterms, the market generally does better after that. I just don't think that this time that's going to carry much weight. It really doesn't change the near-term picture, and the near-term picture and the near-term risk is about Fed. It's about inflation. Inflation has already peaked. I think it is going to gradually fall. We are still racing ahead on all cylinders with an incredibly strong jobs market. Markets have not adjusted to this new Fed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is CPI Thursday, live from New York City. For our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures just about positive TK. The data a couple of hours away. I think every voice we had there in our opening said the election doesn't matter. Let's move <laughs> on. We're not going to move on. Anne Marie Horton will join us here with some of the follow up of the midterm. But, John, you are right. It is CPI Thursday. It matters, and it really matters to get to the next CPI and then to that important Fed meeting. To get you through the rest of the year, I was just going through the dates, Tom. <clears throat> December 2nd for payrolls, December 13th for the next CPI, and then the Federal Reserve December 14th. That's year amazing. Over. I'm After off that, all three days. If you just take every <laughs> single day off that, that those data points land on, Tom, that's basically it, year over. That's, it's year over, but it's important here, and we do it with a, a data screen. We'll get to the data check here, but it really shows the important tension that we've got today. We'll start strong with Michael Pond expert on how inflation links into the fixed income market. How does it link into the equity market? I don't know. Got to talk about crypto too. So at 8.30 Eastern time, I think you have one screen up looking at the CPI to drop. <laughs> and then Bramo, you have another screen up just looking at what crypto's doing, looking at what's happening to Bitcoin over the last couple of days. Really? I can tell that you're being somewhat sarcastic <laughs> and that you're looking for me to basically make What was make disingenuous a fool of about any of that? Well, no, but look. Well, where do you want to start, you know, John? <laughs> we don't normally cover the crypto <clears throat> markets. In as much as we are not covering crypto, the bleed through to the rest of markets is significant. And what you're seeing right now is a crypto meltdown that's really taking all of the speculative money or a lot of it well, out of an asset class that really grew up in the zero rate uh, industry. So, in this zero rate industry, uh, environment. How much are we seeing that, really, the triggers breaking of some of the areas right. that were really fostered by the environment that we've been in over the past Certainly decade? Certainly, Basic, John, to join, and I'm going to talk to her about Sequoia. They take a mark down to zero on whatever this latest blow-up is. And I'm fascinated of how someone as venerable as Sequoia is caught up in this. If you're James Diamond this morning, and you're looking at BitDog down 75% from the, the, sure. the glow... What do you do? I think you're saying, can we replay the clips that were from a couple of years ago when I said, I told you so? Uh, isn't I think that, we've all isn't been, that the Jamie know, Dimon if, quote right now? You know, we don't need the hate mail this morning, folks, but I think it's, it's like, it's like the way Washington... the hate mail. No, but like we Washington agrees on China, the three of us agree on BitDog, we're all suspect. You've, I mean, you've lost just as much money in Facebook over the last 12 months. I didn't own that dog to, either. To be fair. Face dog, we called that. We were pushing 70K on Bitcoin 12 months ago. Yes. And this morning it's 16. It's brutal. It's going to be a lot of pain out the there. Trading range of 10,000. I have no idea. There's no, to me, there's no technical chart. It, this is an out-of-body thing. An out-of-body experience again. <clears throat> yeah. Like the know. midterms for you. I'm going to send Matt Miller a... Uh, <laughs> sure. A uh, bouquet of tulips. I think that'll be appropriate. I'm going to whip through the price action. Do that. Equity futures <laughs> on the S&P up a quarter of 1%, a bouquet of tulips. Futures up a quarter of 1%. Yields unchanged, just north of 4%. Let's call it 4.1% on a 10-year. Euro dollar 99.44. We're negative 7 tenths of 1%. <clears throat> Crude 84.89, Tom, back in the 80s. We're down by 1% again this morning. Yeah. That's been a whole lot softer over the last week. Playing off of the China story, which we don't have much information on this morning, I would say, but I would go to the Bloomberg Terminal, John, and say the two-year yield in the United States is my proxy for what we see at 830. And it's just an easy number to grab onto. It's not the benchmark 10-year, the 30-year playing off of a mortgage and all that, but at 4.61%, that's my barometer for what we see after that inflation report. The data, Bramo, two hours away. Yeah, let's get into it. 830 a.m. U.S. October CPI. We also do get jobless claims, but really, that's going to take a major backseat. How much do we see a slowdown and how significant is it? Are we really going to be looking at the headline number? The expectation is for it to go be below the eight handle to 7.9 percent year over year. How much are we looking for core CPI to decelerate month over month? 
and how much comfort can we actually get from this? I'm curious to see, uh, particularly given the uh, gasoline increase in prices that we've seen adding to the headline figures. At 1 p.m. yesterday, Tom, you laughed at me when I raised the 10-year uh, auction. The 10-year auction moved markets. Arguably, it was one of the worst auctions for the past year, if not more, of 10-year notes. Why? People don't know. Some people saying because of risk off kinds of feelings, both within stocks. Some people, some people even blaming crypto. Some people saying that the meltdown in FTX was causing people to liquidate their treasury holdings in order to meet margin calls. Oh, interesting. And so there wasn't necessarily the same kind of bid behind the tenure. So it was really interesting in market moving. Today is 1 p.m. We get the U.S. selling $21 billion of 30-year notes. And I'm curious to see if there's the same kind of risk aversion in this auction as there was yesterday. And today... Let's get into the Fed speak. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, San Francisco uh, Fed President Mary Daly, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, Kansas City Fed President Esther George, among those speakers. What can they actually say, John, given some of the uh, inflation data that we've seen? And given that they're all coming out now post the election, which evidently didn't matter, according to the intro, how much do they really indicate that they are ready for a step down at a time when markets are not being overly disrupted by the uh, somewhat hawkish prognosis? Today. They should just start a live blog, Tom. They should just start <laughs> a live blog. That's actually not a bad idea. CPI uh, drops and everyone gets their say. What will be the cumulative voice today of the Fed? Are they going to address cumulative? Remember that? We'll see. I guess it depends on the data. Joining us now is Michael Pond to talk about the data. They had a global inflation market strategy at Barclays. Going to catch up with you, sir. Can you walk us through, Michael, what you expect a little bit later this morning? So we're expecting a, another strong print on, on CPI led by the shelter component. Uh, Lisa mentioned energy. That's likely to be strong as well, uh, but a little bit less strong than the September reading. So core CPI rose 0.6 in September. We're looking for 0.4 print. Now, that's still a, a 5 percent annualized rate. So that's much stronger than the Fed would like it to be, and, and we'll keep it on that hawkish mantra. Michael Pond, you are truly expert at this. What does your x-axis look like? What is the how long this of 5% inflation? Well, as you know, Tom, we work in, in more than two dimensions, so it's not just X and Y, it's Zs and and, uh, and uh, Ms as well. You know, we've we, we got to look at the shelter component, okay? Th that's going to drive today's print. The shelter component should be very strong, rising another 0.7, maybe even 0.8 on a month-over-month -month basis. You know, that's well above the, the normal rate. What we know, though, is the rental market uh, in real time has slowed slight, quite significantly. The CPI only picks that up with a lag. So, But today, we'll get a, another strong shelter reading. Beyond that, we do expect to see some weakness. Uh, last month, the core uh, commodity reading, so the core goods reading, actually came in fairly soft, rising uh, at almost almost nothing, uh, basically a flat reading. Uh, that could con con continue to come in soft. We're seeing uh, commodities well off their peaks, commodity futures, shipping rates are down. You mentioned the dollar. While it's flattened out a bit, the dollar is much stronger than it had been. That, too, should put downward pressure on goods prices. So there's a lot of reasons to expect that core goods prices, especially used cars, uh, could actually be in deflationary territory in the near term. But because of that shelter reading, uh, overall core is likely to remain strong for the next several months at least. So regardless of what the reading is, Michael, uh, the derivatives of how people trade it are interesting. How are you thinking about how you will use the input of this data to determine a call, to figure out what's valuable and what's not? Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, again, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the overall reading, but we're diving into the details. If uh, an off consensus print is due to one category that, that is a big outlier. So last month, for example, we had a 45 percent month over month increase in food at businesses and schools. OK, that was all because, uh, you know, the, the free lunch uh, that was uh, offered during the pandemic was gone. Okay, so if we get an outlier like that, the market should dismiss it because the Fed isn't really going to care. Uh, but if, the, if we get a strong shelter reading, what that means, because that tends to trend, is that the next several prints will be strong as well, or at least the market will expect it to be so. And that keeps the Fed uh, on, on this uh, hiking cycle. We're looking for another 50 basis points in December, as you mentioned at the top of the hour. There's a lot of data yet to be seen. So this, this downplays a little bit, this CPI, because we get another one 
ahead of the mid-December FOMC, as well as another payroll report. But uh, no doubt about it, this is a, a really important CPI report. Michael Ponder Barclays. Michael, thank you. What do I often say? The most important since the last until the next. The next one's that's not too far away, shtick. going into you know, the Federal Reserve. Th- th- that's true, John, but I think, you know, to, to not make fun of it, the cumulative set of data here is important. And one thing I'm noticing in terms of inflation is how much there's stuff on sale right now. All of a sudden, retail's coming in. Sure. At the grocery store this weekend, there was more stuff on sale than I've ever seen. And I'm wondering if, you know, Blanche Flower was out on Twitter Yesterday or this morning, I can't remember, with David Rosenberg saying, look, the disinflation, it's here. So, great, you addressed the story 12 months ago. Now we've got a new problem. And isn't that the shift, really, away from goods and towards services? Yes. We're having a different yes. conversation. Yeah. I think well, that's the problem, well, but that it's Pond, shifted. It's shifted it, in know, the last 12 months. You know, Michael Pyle went all spherical geometry on us there with three dimensions, blah, blah, blah. But the answer is he went back to real estate. How do we treat real estate at 8.30 this morning? Rent, mortgage. You know, the well, it's problematic. It. I don't know. It's you saw what happened with Redfin yesterday. What did they cut? 13% of their staff. What does Redfin do? Oh, seriously. Are you serious? I, I have no idea. And they closed their home flipping business. It's an online brokerage. Oh, they're the home brokerage. flipping. Right. Well, they okay. had one home flipping. They, they closed that, but they've got other kinds of valuation services. Yeah. But from a larger perspective. He knows this. Yeah. He, I, you I, think I, so? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, <laughs> He's like, you. no. He anyway, knows this. But I, I will tell you. <laughs> when you flip a home, how long do you own it? Well, actually, what they normally do is they uh, will offer to buy your home on the spot with an iBuyer, and then they, uh, but it's for a lower price than you normally would get it. The bigger point that I was trying to make Please. is the Fed speak will be interesting from this perspective after this. What do they do if it's a softer print? Do they back away from the rate hiking calls? And does that leave people thinking that inflation is going to be more entrenched for longer? I mean, talking about the derivatives of how people trade, what potentially it will get unleashed at 830. One soft print won't get it done. No. That's, That's the another one. Like and another one. Yeah. And the risk for the Fed is that you get the next print is firmer. And you reset the conversation again, going into the Fed. It's good. It keeps us employed. Seen that on repeat. Yeah. Future's up a quarter of 1%. You're going to sidetrack us all morning, aren't you? I know you are. Phil Camparelli's going to join us from JP Morgan in the next hour. Looking forward to that. Equity's up by a quarter of 1%. One eye on crypto, the other eye on CPI data at 8.30 Eastern time. Two hours, 20 minutes away. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Control of the U.S. Senate comes down to three races where votes are still being counted. Each party needs to win two of those states to secure a majority. Georgia, Arizona and Nevada are still in play. The race in Georgia is headed to a runoff next month. Neither Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock nor Republican Herschel Walker received 50 percent of the vote. Hurricane Nicole came ashore on Florida's east coast today, the first hurricane to hit the U.S. in November in almost four decades. It's now weakened to a tropical storm. Forecasters warn it could dump up to eight inches of rain. Bloomberg's learned that crypto exchange FTX.com has told investors that without a bailout, it would need to file for bankruptcy. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried said the company faced a shortfall of up to $8 billion and needed $4 billion to remain solvent. FTX rival Binance had agreed to buy the company, but walked away after conducting due diligence. Meanwhile, U.S. investigator regulators are investigating. And new Twitter owner Elon Musk has emailed his staff for the first time and warned them of, quote, difficult times ahead. Musk wrote that there's no way to sugarcoat the message about the economic outlook. He also said remote work will no longer be allowed and employees are expected to be in the office for at least 40 hours a week. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Our intention is to run again. That's been our intention regardless of what the outcome of this election was. I think everybody wants me to run, but we're going to have discussions about it. And I don't feel in any, any hurry one way or another. The President of the United States, live from New York City, the vote's still being counted. Equity futures going into CPI, shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, <laughs> positive by a third of 1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, 4.0981%, up not even a basis point. And the FX market, euro dollar 99.45. 
Have you seen the uh, front cover of the New York Post this morning? <laughs> Trumpy Dumpty. They've been having fun. So it's a picture of Donald Trump as Humpty Dumpty. It reads Trumpty Dumpty, and it reads as follows. Don, who couldn't build a wall, had a great fall. Can all the GOP's men put the party back together again? That's the front have we heard from them yet? I don't think we have, have we? We have We're, not. We've heard, but like, the hurricane did hit Florida and... yesterday. I, when I flew so... back, the Gulf Stream was down, and I, when I flew back, there was a pilot hitching a ride to try to get to Orlando. It was that bad. I'm hearing a lot of people call for him to delay the announcement he yes. was set to make on yes. November 15th. Like delay into the Georgia, past the Georgia election. And the president himself referenced yesterday, I don't know if you watched that news uh, conference, but in that no, news conference he talked about if he were to announce that he was going to run, he'd wait until the new year. Yeah. So maybe we have to reset things until the new year. We reset by saying thank you to Anne-Marie Horton, who was beyond generous with her time on our trip to Washington. And we could do a two-hour conversation this morning, but she doesn't have the time, and either, I guess, do you on an inflation uh, Thursday. Anne-Marie, let me cut to the reality here, and it goes back to the song seared in her brain from the great Broadway play, South Pacific, Belly High May Call You. It is calling world leaders. What will be accomplished in Bali coming up here in the coming days? Well, the big really ticket item for this G20 is, of course, going to be the fact that we are expecting President Biden to sit down with Xi Jinping. And it's an interesting moment because, of course, Xi Jinping is off the heels of this president breaking right. term and he has all these loyalists behind him. And President Biden, though, is going into this meeting much stronger than many would anticipate. And last night he's saying he also plans to run for re-election. But the deliverables is going to be challenging, right, because this relationship is really straining at the moment, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's chips. Mm -hmm. That is going to be interesting. But one thing that might start to cool down the temperature a bit between China and the United States is the fact that President Vladimir Putin is not showing up to this G20. So potentially the issue of Ukraine between China and the United States, it will be discussed, but there won't be as much concern around it with right. President Putin not showing his face. Even with a Republican House and who knows in the Senate, this is a president who travels, what, a thousand miles from Singapore, happy, happy, happy. How does the election change a Biden in Bali? Well, it's not just Bali, right? His first stop is going to be Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. He's going to be talking uh, about climate change. And what we saw from this election is that the youth vote is still incredibly important. Those are individuals who vote for, voted for him as well for president. And I think that is going to give his administration a little bit more oomph, really, to lean into the climate change talk, even though they're obviously still concerned about higher energy prices. So this puts Biden and his team in a much stronger position to talk about these types of subjects and also meet with adversarial leaders. With this new, more moderate Congress that we're looking at, the likelihood of in Washington, there is one uh, area that everyone seems to agree on, and it is China. And heading into this meeting with Xi Jinping, what's your sense of how much pressure there is from Congress to not only crack down on some of the trade relationships with China, but U.S. companies that do business in that nation and basically setting parameters for that. Well, this administration, and as you said, Lisa, it's really a bipartisan topic in Washington, D.C. You'd be hard-pressed to find any politician that does not want to go after China. So there is going to be really a consensus of this administration, I think, speaking for the United States as a whole, going into this meeting. Um, this is why it's going to be very difficult for them to be any big deliverables. The president said last night, a question from our very own Jenny Leonard about China and about this meeting, he said there will be no fundamental concessions. So what can they really come out with? Maybe a joint statement or uh, statements about that they want to see peace on the European continent, maybe something about climate change and how they're still going to put those negotiations back on the table. Because remember, when the House Speaker Pelosi went over to Taiwan, China ripped the carpet under the United States when it came to climate talks and also some military talks. And now we have Kevin McCarthy, who's poised to be the new speaker, also telling reporters that he would love to lead a delegation there. So there's not really much that can come out of it because of where the relationship is right now. How difficult is it for this administration to take a leadership role in climate change when they're trying to also send a <laughs> message that they're not opposed to the fossil fuel industry? It's been incredibly challenging. 
They've wanted to call these assets stranded assets. Stranded assets. President Biden campaigned on the fact that he wants to get rid of fossil fuels. He wants to be a climate president. At the same time, he also cannot have gasoline prices north of $5 a gallon, which is what we saw in June, which is when we saw his polls really precipitously drop. This is something that is very difficult for this administration to square because they really want to read it, re lean into the renewable story and the transi transition, but at the same time, they recognize they need these fossil fuels, and they need them now more than ever, because after this G20, December 5th is a key date to watch. If this oil price cap is not done, it could potentially be challenging for buyers to buy Russian crude, and we can see shut-ins. And if COVID starts to ease up in China, we are going to see crude prices spike. Yeah. AMH, down in Washington, tremendous work over the last couple of days, as always. Anne-Marie, thank you. So there are two potential bilats on the table next week. The obvious one is between the President of the United States and the Chinese leader. Tom, that's the obvious one. The interesting one from, from my perspective is actually whether he meets Chancellor Schultz or not. I think that Schultz going to Beijing was controversial. Yes. The Europeans very recently have been complaining about the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. The IRA, of course, is something else. For the Europeans, it's about state aid. And I wonder what that's going to look like in the coming weeks and months, the tension potentially between the Europeans and the Americans. The other foreign policy to watch is the foreign policy, as you mentioned, with Mr. Trump in the New York Post, the, the foreign policy discussions within the Republican Party and the foreign policy discussions post-election within the Democratic Party. What kind of tone can Biden set with the Democrats to say, hey, we got this right where did we get it wrong? That introspection there as well. I didn't hear that in the news conference. Yesterday. I did not hear that in the news conference. No. I didn't hear that yesterday. There's an article in the New York Times today, young reporter Nicholas Fondos. It is brilliant on what the Democrats got wrong on crime. Brilliant. Hope brilliant. we just kind of got over the finish line and the rest didn't, right? I, I think it's, it's complex here. And of course, am I right? We wait for December. Do we have a date in December for Georgia? I think it is the 6th. Six, six. Yes, yeah, it is the 6th. That's the date. Election's I've not seen over. Some. Not yet. We can say we're election central. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York, CPI data two hours away, going into it. Here's the price action. Equities up a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Futures pushing just a little bit higher. The three-day winning streak on the S&P snapped yesterday with a decent day of losses, actually. On the Nasdaq, we try and bounce back as well, up a half of 1%. In the bond market, two-year yields, about 20 basis points below the highs of last week at about 461 on a two-year this morning. Yields trying to bounce back as well, up three basis points. Your 10-year, 4.1%. Your euro, euro dollar, the pain still to come in Europe. How many times have we talked about this? We've had the tightening cycle. Let's talk about the consequences. 99.53, Tom, on euro dollar, yeah, negative six-tenths of 1%. Scope and scale, magnitude. We're talking about inflation here, and we'll do this with Sarah House in a moment. But, John, over there, it is a magnitude more urgent, given a, a, an active war in Ukraine. What can they do about it? What can they do about it? The answer is nothing. About got it? a and war. The criticism is going to build even more when growth starts to roll over, Tom. What can they do about it? Well... I go back to the headline of the month. We, we don't have time now to recapitulate it, but Governor Bailey with a stretched out two-year recession, I have never seen that, ever. If, if, ever. if they deliver what's priced in the rates market, and they're yeah. trying to push back against that, they're trying to walk <clears> much more, I think more of a delicate dance over the Bank of England than maybe the Federal Reserve. By mandate, maybe. I think they're yes. worried. I think yeah. you can really sense they're worried about the growth backdrop yeah. in a way that this Federal Reserve is not. Next year, it's going to change. When the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve is in conflict, different picture. And when that starts, I think, Lisa, we have a different kind of tension mm -hmm. over the Fed. Did you see what Charlie Evans over the Chicago Fed Mr. said Please. yesterday? I saw that in the, in the exit interview. In his exit interview. Basically, he's going to leave. He's going to give up his post in January. And he came out yesterday in a speech where he talked about the fear that the Fed was going too fast and that if the Fed is too aggressive mm -hmm. and overshoots, that they could struggle to get inflation above 2% over the long term like it had been. So going back to the same regime. Right. You don't hear this from anyone else. And I think it's interesting well, as he exits the Fed that he sounds 
becomes this note of incredible dovishness that is more sensitive to these balanced right. risks. And, and, and sophisticated and freshwater and Carnegie Mellon and all that. But what's important there is the history of the 40s into the 50s, where you went from rampant post-World War II inflation down to true John. We actually got to a true deflation with early Eisenhower. You just have to ask them for their assessment of the risks around policy right now. And when they tell you that the risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much, yeah. that's an implied commitment to over tightening. Yes. It's there. It's in it's, the language of the Federal Reserve. That's a commitment to well over tightening. Said. Well, you know, it, it's it's there and it's the history and, of course, the skeleton of the Bank of Japan, I'm going to say 15, maybe 20 years ago as well. A good conversation to begin with Sarah House, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Sarah, what we love is we have Michael Pond on from Barclays with the fixed income dynamics of today's report. And now we're really going to drill down. What part of headline inflation will you study first? So one I'm looking at in terms of where it comes in versus the overall consensus is looking at a few pockets that I think we, we see some dis disinflationary forces gathering. So I think autos will be a big one today, not just used, but vehicles, given right. that we have, have seen inventories pick up there. And I think a lot of pricing constraints on the part of the consumer, too. But also, of course, shelter. That really sets the tone for not just what inflation does in October, but what it'll do in, in the months ahead. So I think those those are two of the key categories to dissect. Will the Fed dissect? Will the Fed partition or do they just look at the two statistics that come out? No, they'll partition it. So in addition to just the headline and, and core, so they do ha like to look at various slices and dices of the data. So whether that's the median CPI, which I think gives you a, a nice, just clean, uh, clean look at an alternative measure of the core, whether it's the sticky, the flexible CPIs that we get from Atlanta. But I think one of the things we've seen is a lot of questions over do they do they discount shelter, given that we do see that uh, rental price pressures are, are certainly coming down. But we saw in Powell's press conference after the last meeting that, no, he is very much looking at shelter, which I think is will be important as we think about what this print means for near-term Fed policy. If Fed officials had a live blog and were discussing a CPI print, as essentially perhaps you could say they are in terms of just how many speakers we have today, what would you be looking to understand from them after the CPI print? So I think I'd be looking at some of the short-term versus versus more persistent forces of, of inflation. So what we're seeing in those areas that can move pretty quickly, so things like travel services, prices, those those reset, the autos, which we, which we already mentioned, but some of the more persistent ones. So whether that's shelter, but also some of the more mundane services. So uh, what we see in some of the medical care, like physicians or hospital services, what we're seeing in tuition and child care, home insurance, auto insurance, and so I think some of that dissection of which of these categories have longer momentum, more scope for, for catch up, and which ones tend to move and reprice more quickly. So we've been talking about how the election doesn't matter and how it, we're kind of beyond that. And now it's all about CPI. But would you completely agree on this? And, and yesterday I elicited groans from myself when I started talking about debt ceilings and the potential for some sort of risk or brinkmanship heading into a default. But I am seeing more and more notes that this is actually hugely concerning and could tip the scales in terms of how deep the recession is just simply because of spending cuts and because of the uncertainty fueling even higher uh, yields in the 10 year. What What's your view on the importance of these types of tit for tat in DC? Well, I think the fact that we will have, it looks like very likely like we'll have divided government with the Republicans at least taking the House. It does mean that there won't be any major fiscal packages here in, in the near term. But I think that does mean that the, the potential depth of an upcoming recession, it could be even deeper because you might not have that agreement over, over fiscal support. Now, if it's deep enough, you might see some bipartisan help. But I think particularly given the inflationary backdrop, some of the fears of, of how much fiscal policy could contributed to that, I think overall we get a pretty muted response from the fiscal policy sector come that next downturn, which leaves monetary policy as, as really, once again, the, the main lever for, uh, for, for supporting the economy. Sarah, 99.825 percent, excuse me, I've got election details in my head, 99.825 percent of our audience on radio and TV look at headline inflation. There's no core, there's no Dallas trim mean. Walk us through again why animals like you, like the chairman of the Federal Reserve, don't look at headline inflation. It's nonsensical. 
Well, we do look at headline inflation, both us and the Federal Reserve, because that does have a, a meaningful impact on consumers' ability to, to spend in, in real terms. But the core and, and various cuts of it are so important because that gives you a better sense of where inflation is going, how quickly it, it might come down. And while there's very likely that we'll see directional improvement in inflation, one has, one has to be careful about losing sight that it still remains a long way back to, to 2%. I mean, I, 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 okay, long way back to 2%. Where are you modeling that we, we pause, if you will? On a core inflation basis, we're five or six ish. Do we pause at three? Do we get stuck at four? So we believe that you can get core CPI coming down to, let's say, roughly 3.5% by, by the end of next year. But that's still well above the Fed's target, even when yes. you adjust it for their 2% their you know, being really focused at, at the PCE deflator. We forecast out through 2024, and even then we don't get core, uh, core inflation moving down to 2% consistent levels of, of inflation. I think that's going to be an important story over the next year or so, is that there is a lot of disinflationary forces here in train. I think we're likely to see uh, some pretty market improvement over the next 12 months or so, but squeezing out that last little bit of inflation to get all the way back to 2%, that's going to be a much harder ask. So it's not just about supply chains, but it's also about what we're seeing in terms of the labor market, the wage cost pressures that we continue to see, and the fact that, sure, inflation expectations haven't necessarily broken out of historical ranges, but they're at the upper end of that. And so we're still overall, I think, in a, in a very uh, elevated inflation environment. Does the conversation change, Tom, when we get down to four? Do they start to tolerate something different? I, I thought They're not going to signal brilliant. that now. We know that. But does that change in a year's time? I mean, I, I hope the governor of the Bank of England was listening to that because that's where we're going. And governor Bailey always tunes <clears> I would say the U.S. zeitgeist now, John, is all focused on one month out, three months out, you know, three meetings out and that. And Sarah okay. House and Andrew Bailey are way out. Sarah House there of Wells Fargo. <clears throat> Lisa, I'm pleased you brought up the midterms. I caught up with Morgan Stanley, Michael Zizis, yesterday, and he talked about the importance of the midterms, potentially taking on increased importance over time. And I've been asking this question, I know you have as well. We have to ask ourselves, what is the optimal policy mix now? And what do we think the optimal policy mix should be in 12 months' time? Now, I think if you ask people, they want a Federal Reserve to deal with inflation and they want fiscal policy just to not get in the way. Stay out of the way. We don't need a UK situation here in America. Fine. Is that going to be the story 12 months from now? Is that the optimal policy mix in 12 months. Well, and some people are saying that actually the gridlock that you are going to see in D.C. is going to cause gridlock. a deeper recession, actually. And because exactly to that point, over the longer term, the lack of fiscal response and also the fact that you're going to get cuts in spending, right? You are actually going to get cuts because in order to not default, in order to meet that debt ceiling limit, and because of the oh, aversion to on. raise it, people are going to cut uh, costs, which is going to lead to an even Wait, less fiscal The politicians are going to cut costs? They're going to be budget cuts? Yeah. I, I just don't believe it. We're going into an election. The election starts now. Humpty Dumpty, Trumpy Dumpty and all that. It's starting right now. Just to be clear, nobody's in case going to cut costs. Anyone's just tuning in. Tom referencing a front page of the New York Post this <laughs> I, morning. Lisa's I, raising an important question, Tom. Right now, the consensus around the economy is short and shallow if we get a recession. I actually think when it comes to the policy mix, it raises questions about duration and maybe not depth so much. If you don't have I agree. that Under circuit ratio. breaker from fiscal policy or from monetary policy, this downturn can go on for maybe longer than you but think it can. we've said that surveillance has said that all year. I, I, I'm sorry. The well, x-axis just goes out. I will give you this, not from me, but from Robert Dent, a former Fed economist mm -hmm. who works at Nomura, yep. who wrote, instead of fiscal support, we're expecting debt limit volatility, government shutdown volatility, and potential spending cuts. And it's the reason why he sees the unemployment rate going up to 6.4% in a recession lasting about 15 do, come months. On. So just a, to give you a sense of how people are shifting this. If they do a crime bill, is someone going to vote against that right now? I don't think so. What kind of crime bill would they do? To I don't know. You know, they'll, they'll make it up. They got to do something to show that they're against. The crime interesting split the at the moment when you speak to people in fixed income, the state level finances. It's a very different situation yes. compared yeah. to what yeah. could happen at the federal level. They could loosen the purse strings. Yeah, well, they've got the cash for now. For now, futures up four tenths on the S and P. That was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's good, Tom. Nice. They do okay there? Oh, you're fantastic, as always. It's Election Central. From New York, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> now, 
always a good time. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Figures out today are likely to show that U.S. inflation moderated only slightly last month, and that's keeping a fifth straight 75 basis point rate hike on the table for the Fed's meeting next month. Economists forecast that the consumer price index will show a 7.9% increase on an annual basis. The CPI comes out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. President Biden says he still plans to seek re-election and will likely make it official early next year. The president spoke after Democrats avoided worst-case scenario congressional losses in midterm elections. Now, he said the final decision on running again depends on his health and discussions with his family. Meanwhile, British Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt is considering whether to impose the top income tax rate on more Britons. Bloomberg's learned Hunt is thinking about lowering the 172,000 threshold at which the 45% tax rate is paid. Now, Hunt and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak are looking for more than $57 billion of spending cuts and tax hikes. It was the largest single owner art auction in history. In just two and a half hours Wednesday night, Christie's presided over the sale of just over 60 artworks for an unprecedented $1.5 billion. Now they came from the collection of late Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. Among them were works from Lucian Freud, Gustav Klimt, and Paul Cezanne. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Right now, we're in a, in a higher interest rate environment to try to bring inflation back down. Financial markets seem to believe that, it, that inflation should fall back down towards our 2% target over the next couple of years. I hope they're right. Uh, I know that we're going to do what we need to do to bring inflation back down. Neil Kashkari there, the Minneapolis Fed president. His words, any talk of a pivot is entirely premature. Price action looks like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures, positive four-tenths of 1%. Positive on CPI data that is about, what, an hour and a bit away? An hour and 42 minutes away, Tom. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, 4.0885% on a 10-year euro dollar. Negative six-tenths of 1%, just in and around parity over the last couple of days. 99.48 and crude from the 90s back to the 80s again. 85.37, down a half of 1%. The rumour mill in China is still in overdrive. And Chinese officials, Tom, seemingly pushing back against this idea they're going to reopen and drop COVID. Yeah, yeah that, that's soon. sort of where we are right now. It could yeah, change it tomorrow. It could change today. I mean, I, I really don't know where we are. As we go to Bali, Emory Horton again will be in Bali uh, with the president. And did she allude that the president of China may be there? You wonder if they'll meet. I guess it's like anticipated. Anticipated is the right. Is that the right word? The right word, I think, into next week. We'll see, of course, a, a long ways away, and it'll be interesting there. And, of course, one of the themes in Bali with G20 will be climate. It was one of the themes in the election, maybe below the radar, of crime, immigration, inflation, the economy of America. But nevertheless, it is always with us. Michael Regan joins us now, administrator, yes, of the Environmental Protection Agency, but far more from the backbone in the fields, the hills of North Carolina. He's got an understanding of the value of climate to our South. Michael, thank you so much for joining us from COP27. The problem with these interviews is we tend to go big and broad. I want to go narrow, and it does go to the president's back and forth on hydrocarbons, on oil, on net gas, and also on methane emissions from oil. Take us into that little narrow window of methane emissions and what can be accomplished. Well, thank you for having me. And, you know, the president has pledged that we'll continue to move forward uh, to reduce global warming, uh, to reduce these emissions that cause global warming. Uh, he never pledged that we would get out of it immediately overnight, but he pledged that we could work our way out of this. And so I think when we talk about methane in particular, uh, the conversations that I'm having uh, with the oil and gas sector, with technology providers, uh, with you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, is that we see an opportunity to deploy technology to reduce methane uh, and actually save the loss of gas and gas products while saving the planet and protecting public health. We know the technologies exist. Uh, we know that there are advanced technologies and business models that right. can adjust to reducing methane. And so EPA's job is to put some rules 
of engagement in the role so that all companies know and can make these longer term investments. How does EPA's job change with the election, including a big Republican win in your North Carolina? I I'm fascinated how the oil and gas industry that has a GOP bent will change and amend coming off this election. Well, you know, we're, the president has had a historic two years in passing historic legislation with the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, resources coming to EPA uh, to help with and enhance the regulations uh, that we are required to put in place by law. Uh, so I don't think the elections will change the fact that EPA has legislative authority or uh, authority provided by the legislature uh, or, or Congress uh, to pursue the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to protect public health and protect the planet. We're going to continue to move forward and, and do our job, but the resources that flow from the, uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act just help with that public-private partnership to pursue these reductions, so we're not solely reliant on regulations alone. How complicated is it right now, Michael, to be with this mandate to reduce emissions at a time where people are prioritizing fossil fuels in light of some of the shortages, in light of the war in Ukraine? Is it perhaps taking some energy away from what you're saying or making it more difficult to argue your cause? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a speed bump, right? I mean, I think we find ourselves in this position uh, where many countries are overly reliant on fossil fuels provided by, uh, you know, countries like Russia at a time where it's, it's, it's inconvenient. And we are seeing that this unprovoked war with Ukraine is causing pain globally. If we were not so dependent on these fossil fuels, if we had made the proper investments in clean technologies and energy efficiency and d more domestic uh, opportunities, uh, we would not see the price volatil volatility that we're seeing internationally. So it's a wake-up call, right? Uh, number one, it is very inconvenient, obviously. But number two, uh, it is really forcing all of us uh, here at COP uh, to think through how we continue to double down and invest in alternatives uh, to fossil fuels. Michael Regan, thank you, sir. Michael Regan there of the EPA. The President of the United States will be in Egypt tomorrow. Tom, what a busy schedule for the President over the next week uh, to Egypt and then this. on to to the G20. It's exhausting. I don't care how cushy Air Force One is. This is a lot of miles. And I believe that on to Cambodia even as well. I think that's uh, scheduled. And you just, it, it is, he's going to show, he's going to come back. First of all, he's going to come back to a Georgia election. I mean, that's the first sure. thing. He's going to celebrate the holidays, which is which is a good and wonderful thing. But I agree, it's an exhausting trip. And we'll see how consequential that Georgia election might be. Another piece of news I wanted to draw your attention to, Elon Musk in his first email to Twitter staff, ending remote work, ending yeah. remote work. How quickly that story's changed. So a year ago, 18 months ago, we were talking about the death of the office. I'm sure, Lisa, you've had <coughs> similar conversations. I've been speaking to people in the market who runs, say, a trading desk or a division within a bank, an asset manager, who have f said that all of a sudden people are starting to come back to work. The why? Let's just say job security has been replaced with a little bit of job insecurity over the last few months. We've talked about this, right? How much is an economy that perhaps isn't as hot? Perhaps that's going to drive more people back to the office to make sure that they get that face time or make sure that they're seen as essential. But it's also the bosses want to see them back there, like Elon Musk. Well, they've saying, wanted that for a long time. And they've wanted that for a long time. And now they can exercise that power perhaps a little bit more when the balance of, uh, of, of power has changed a little bit. Elon Musk isn't really making friends there. He comes in, he cuts half the staff, he says, don't work from home anymore, uh, throws everything up in the air. I mean, can you imagine some of the uh, morale there? He did one of the spaces things. Do you know those spaces things yeah, on Twitter? Yeah. I kind of like them. I tune into them sometimes. He was doing one of them, and he was being interviewed, Tom, about advertising and the platform and the changes we could get. And you can see on spaces who's listening. I can tell you, Tom, pretty much every single brand under the sun was there listening to that conversation with Elon Musk yesterday. There is a ton of uncertainty about where these advertisers want their brands to be and whether Twitter is still a platform for them. I remember when Tesla was a failure and everybody marked this guy down as buffoon. And 
boom, oh. all of a sudden it was a success. Can he do that pixie dust with, with Twitter? The problem is, is that his message is not cohesive. It's not clear what his ultimate goal is. I mean, was he giving a better sense to advertisers yesterday? I think it was somewhat confusing. Can he repeat yeah. the act, Tom? I'm with you. That's the big question. Live from New York, CPI, one hour, 34 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. You look at the midterms, the market generally does better after that. I just don't think that this time that's going to carry much weight. It really doesn't change the near-term picture, and the near-term picture and the near-term risk is about Fed, it's about inflation. Inflation has already peaked. I think it is going to gradually fall. We are still racing ahead on all cylinders with an incredibly strong jobs market. Markets have not adjusted to this new Fed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. CPI data 90 minutes away, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures are just about positive on the S&P, up a quarter of 1%. TK, the data, 8.30 Eastern time. 8.30 Eastern time, we'll go beneath the headline data. And John, and inflation, you just partition out. You've got to partition out real estate. I mean, we've heard in two shelter. interviews this morning. Shel okay, fa excuse me, folks. It's called shelter, not real estate. <laughs> State. Wasn't a correction. Rent, <laughs> I was just echoing. OER, that housing, whatever. It's you know I looked it up the other You're day. It fighting. is exactly thirty three. I know, John. It's thirty three percent of the pie. I mean, people spend thirty three percent nationally on average on shelter. Nice. You're very delicate this morning. <laughs> very good. Okay. That's Ramo, what we're going to see. You get the data and then you get the Fed live blog straight afterwards. <laughs> I, I love mean, who, who is not speaking today? Well, Fed Chair Jay Powell for one, <laughs> Lael Brainerd for another. So the people who actually perhaps are central and who might disagree with each other actually in terms of how quickly the Fed has to go, which that is would be interesting. interesting. Um, but we're not getting from the leadership necessarily. Still, whether you start to see a growing number of Fed officials Talk about the risks of the overshoot and what that could do longer term to the economy and potential uh, inflation may be interesting just because we've started to see it around the edges from the likes of Charlie Evans. Isn't that why they're slowing down anyway, or at least implying, suggesting to us that they will slow down? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, cumulative lags and all that stuff. Sure. At the same time, if you hold rates at 5%, there is a cumulative effect of that that people haven't really fully gamed out because it's impossible okay. to do so. But the debate here, and, and for people watching who aren't the sophisticates of John Farrow and Shelter, the bottom line is there's a group of people <laughs> saying we're super restrictive. We're restrictive. Are we? And there's, uh, I, that's the yeah. debate. And to me, it's people ignoring the elephants in the room of CPI. They're ignoring, I mean, I'm making a joke about it, but you're right, John. They're ignoring shelter. They're ignoring selective food. Can we do that? 100% of our audience is saying that's nuts. They're looking at inventory over at retailers and saying, look, goods disinflation is starting to appear. And other people are saying, well, hold on a second. That was the story of last year. You're seeing a shift. It's stickier. It's broader. It's gone to services now. That's the problem for this Fed. They're constantly chasing their tail, Tom. I, I agree with the expos chasing the tail. And after this report and the next report before the Fed meeting, they're going to be ever more expos in behind. Well, when you're talking about why this matters, why? what's the difference between holding it at 5% for two months versus a year? I'm going to put this uh, number on it. The Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index for the United States, that is a uh, top-rated debt of governments and corporations, stands at $23.6 trillion dollars. If that resets at another level, what does that do to an entire nation's in terms of borrowing costs and in terms of abilities to borrow? Sure. I'm going to throw this out there because I think about things a little bit differently sometimes. I don't think the end of hiking is the same as the end of tightening. Correct. I think if you pause at 5% and the economy rolls over and you don't cut, that Fed's getting tighter. Don't you think that Fed's getting yes. tighter in that world? Yes. If inflation's yes. coming down, if growth is rolling over and they and remain they at five percent and they move. don't cut, they don't move. That Fed's getting tighter. And that's why I push back around this idea that maybe we've seen sort of like peak Fed. Peak Fed for me, and I think for others too, is if you have a recession and they're not cutting interest rates. That's when you're gonna feel some real pain. Tightness is a relative game. 
I think that's another way of saying it. And yep. when the relative game changes into a weaker reality, all of a sudden the Fed's position carries a lot more weight to do nothing rather than just continue to tighten. Nicely put. The market looks like this. Well said. Well said, Bramo. Equity Shout futures <clears throat> up a third of 1%. Look out for Shouter later. <laughs> Boom. Yields unchanged on the 10-year. Lisa, about 4.1% on 10s this morning. Euro dollar, stronger dollar, weaker euro, euro dollar, 99.44. All right, 8.30 a.m., we get that U.S. October CPI. We're expecting it to be 7.9%, which is coming down on the headline figure from the 8.2%. Does that matter? Is it really going to be the month over month and the X energy and food that people are going to be parsing through? And then, of course, people will dismiss this as not as important as the next one that we're going to get. In December, at 1 p.m., we get an auction. U.S. selling $21 billion of 30-year notes. Tom always dismisses this. However, it is important to note that yesterday's moved the market broadly. It moved equity markets because it did not go well. Ten-year yields were much higher in the end sale than people had been expecting. And a lot of people were wondering why. A whole host of reasons we can get into throughout the show. And today, let's talk about the live blog that John uh, labeled as such. Fed speak, including Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, and Kansas City Fed President Esther George. Can't wait. A little bit later, Tom. It's like it's, a who's who of Fed speak. It's... Out of, out, you excited you know, for that? You, know, you were about to say out of control. Out of control. Out of control. I just think it's there ridiculous. It is. Boom. Just say it. Yeah, exactly. So, so do I want to hear from five Fed officials or do you want to hear from Phil Camparella? I want to hear from Phil. You know, that's what Joins matters. us right now from J.P. Morgan yeah. Asset Management Portfolio Manager. Phil, let's start here. When do we stop calling this a bear market rally and start calling it a bull market? At what point do we do that? Yeah, not yet, John. So uh, I, I think, first of all, happy CPI Day, which isn't really happy this year because it's been a recurring nightmare for investors as inflation has been very, very slow to, to come down. It's caused terminal rates to jump. It's caused the dollar to rally. It's caused equity markets to fall, right? So it's been a recurring nightmare all, all year. And I think that's the reason why we're still underweight, while we're fading some of these rallies, and why we don't think that the rallies have much legs, at least through the end of the year. Because as I keep telling people, and it's like, Groundhog Day, there's a terminal rate problem in the equity market. In other words, we have no idea when the Fed is going to stop. And they mentioned last time, you know, maybe we'll pause and maybe there's a lagged effect to all of our, our tightening. But that's besides the fact. Mm. If we continue to get sticky inflation, there is no Fed right. member that wants to go down in history as losing the fight on inflation. And that's why we're cautious uh, on the equity That's market. every behavioral action I've ever seen from the central bank coming off what Bank of Japan did 20 years ago. The real yield, 1.65%. Translate a higher real yield as they move to some form of terminal rate. Mm -hmm. over to the equity market. Why should stock pickers or index buyers worry about a 1.85% yeah. real yield? Yeah, so it's the opposite, Tom, of the Tina trade. Remember last cycle? There is no alternative. <coughs> Cash rates at zero, negative real yields, helping mega cap stock names, helping the cap-weighted S&P 500 index do really well. It's the opposite of that now. Now there are a ton of alternatives, Tom. I can't believe how much I'm talking about things like cash rates and T-bills and a 4% risk-free rate. And that just raises the barrier of entry into all of those asset classes that did so, so well when PEs went to the moon in the last cycle because there was no alternative. So cash for us is a nice alternative. We have 10% of our strategy in cash. That's the most we've ever had in the strategy wow. In, wow. in cash. And also, so in the front end of the curve with the Fed jacking up the yield curve in the front end and going by 75 all the time, there's really high quality credit where you can get a 6% yield, Lisa. Wait, can we sit on this for yeah. a second, Phil? 10% of your portfolio, the highest of yes. all time. Can you give us a sense of how you've built that over the year and whether yeah. you could see it going even higher? Yeah, so I think even higher, Lisa, would be in a world where the Fed would have to break the back of the economy in order to get inflation back down to, to their targets, right? That's to be determined. That's a tail risk. So that would be even higher. Um, and I would say, you know, summer ish is when we started to build that up. Remember when we got that CPI number for May and then, and then the Fed had to call the Wall Street Journal and say, we've got to do a 75 basis point hike. So that's when we started to, that's when we started to raise, raise cash in, in the portfolio and we've kept it there. And again, I, I can't stress enough, that was trash in the last cycle. The opportunity cost of holding cash was so high because rates were at zero. And now again, it's raising the barrier of entry into every other asset class. If I can sit on a risk-free rate at 4%. So when you talk about potential more downside risk in mm -hmm equities, how much are you looking at the potential for triggers like mm -hmm. 
Bitcoin um, and FTX collapsing and other types of events that might seem peripheral, but that do have forced selling on the other side of them. Yeah, Lisa, this all comes down to sentiment, right? So if folks are seeing things that they presume to be safe, right, as as the bottom is falling out, that's going to drive sentiment. Same thing when we talked about the UK a couple of weeks ago, right? That didn't necessarily affect the US because it was a very specific thing in the, that was happening in the UK, but that was a sentiment driver and rates were taken up higher here in, in, in sympathy. So I think just seeing volatility in things that were very, very um, good in the last cycle, uh, I, I think just puts pressure on the market in general. Once you've made the decision to go to cash, you've got to make a new decision. Mm -hmm. When do you get out of cash? Yeah. What's on the dashboard for you to make that call? Yeah, so it's this race, John, between growth and inflation. So if we can get to a point, and by the way, a soft landing is not uh, avoiding recession anymore. A soft landing, as you guys were pointing to, is a mild recession right now. So I think this race between growth and inflation, John, and I think the earliest we can think about it is the first quarter of next year, because one number does not make a trend. So if today's CPI number comes in good and people are, are, are cheering, you're not going to get the open mouth operations to be cheering, right? And the, and the parade of, of Fed speakers, they're not going to be cheering anything. So I think it has to be at least two numbers, at least, and that'd be like a perfect scenario, right? But at least two numbers. I don't think the Fed is going to say anything in their December meeting that's going to be good for investors. So in the first quarter, if you can get inflation turning down and growth at or around trend or a little bit even below trend, John, that could be a good environment for the equity market that allows the Fed to pause at a time where they don't have to break the back of the economy. And then we're thinking about things like equities again, and even things like high yield. Just finally, we used to joke about the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. controlling the S&P 500 yeah. and having a price target. Is that a little bit more real now? Do you get the sense that they do have a limit on where they want this market to be and where they don't want it to be? Um, I don't. I don't think so, John. Only because like that 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 strategy of okay, late 2018 into 19, worst Christmas Eve the, that we ever saw in 2018. Fed pauses in 19 and then starts to move rates down in July. You throw that out the window when inflation is at eight percent. Totally. Yeah. So now it's a Fed call. Yes. No longer a Fed put. That's right. And I'm thinking about the upside. Yeah. Are they uncomfortable with 4K? Do they like that? Do you get the feeling they want to push back against no, that? No, they do. Yes, they do not want financial conditions to ease anytime soon, John. That's the problem, isn't it, TK? It is, and you watch the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, and it's a little more restrictive over the last post-election days. Coming up, I'm going to bring you a call from Dan Ives of Wedbush on Tesla. Finally, cut the price target in a big way, so he we can talk it. about that in just a moment. Patrick Armstrong is going to join us in the next hour as well. Phil, this was awesome. Thank you. No Yankees talk. No Aaron Judge talk. Tom, no. We just Judge looks one awfully good in the Red Sox uniform. You reckon? When right. the Astros just win, so. we don't talk about baseball. That's true. Right there, you got it. <laughs> Live from New York. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Victoria. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Control of the U.S. Senate comes down to three races where votes are still being counted. Each party needs to win two of those states to secure a majority. Georgia, Arizona and Nevada still in play. And the race in Georgia headed to a runoff next month. Neither Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock nor Republican Herschel Walker received 50 percent of the vote. In China, the government has once again reiterated its support for the COVID-0 policy. Still, it's urging more precise and targeted control measures against the virus. According to the state-run news agency, Beijing will try to minimize the impact of economic and social developments. Bloomberg's learned that crypto exchange FTX.com has told investors that without a bailout, it would need to file for bankruptcy. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried said the company faced a shortfall of up to $8 billion and needed $4 billion to remain solvent. FTX rival Binance had agreed to buy the company but walked away after conducting due diligence. Meanwhile, U.S. regulators are investigating. New Twitter owner Elon Musk has emailed his staff for the first time and warned them of, quote, difficult times ahead. Musk wrote that there is no way to sugarcoat the message about the economic outlook. He also said remote work will no longer be allowed and employees are expected to be in the office for at least 40 hours a week. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. While the press and the pundits are predicting a giant red wave, uh, it didn't happen. And I know you were somewhat miffed by my uh, 
my uh, obsessive optimism, but uh, I felt good during the whole process. The President of the United States feeling good, live from New York City. CPI data, one hour, 12 minutes away. Going into it, equities look like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures firmer, positive, higher, by a couple of tenths of 1%. Yields down by almost a basis point, 4.1%, let's call it, on a 10-year. This from Dan Ives of Wedbush yes. months ago. And on Twitter, and I've got the note as well, but let's start with the tweet from Dan this morning with Tesla up by about a third of 1%, 178 in the pre-market, new price target at Wedbush, 250, down from 300. Now sitting on top of the peak of the mountain with Tesla in a massive position of strength, Musk has managed to do what the bears have unsuccessfully tried for years, crush Tesla's stock by his own doing in what we view as a purely painful, dark situation. Dan Ives has been a big bull on that stock, Tom, for a yeah. long, long time. Just because of time, let's move to the future. Is it presumed that Mr. Musk will sell other shares of Tesla? Don't know. We don't that's know. been the trend. Yeah. That's been the trend. And that's been the problem for the likes of Dan Ives and others, Lisa. Well, and it's also been just brand destruction in terms of all of the news that we've heard out of Twitter and just what you spoke about, John, about the spaces that he held and trying to get advertisers to stay with him. Is he becoming toxic to his himself and to his company that has been a shining from a, star? From a strategic uh, you know, as an amateur on this, from a strategic standpoint, are there like 42 or 47 electric vehicle-like cars competing now with Tesla? There's a lot of competition there, coming. I, I just don't get it. And he's been a big part of that, encouraging that competition yes, by the yeah. immense success he's had over the last few years. What I don't get about this call from Dan, and I'd love to catch up with him soon, and I'm sure we will. He's Probably always open to these questions. Show today with Muhammad Alarian. If he believes it's a painful, dark situation, why has he still got an outperform rating on the stock? Yeah. It goes on to say at the bottom of the note, we're lowering our price target from 300 to 250, reflecting a lower multiple associated with the Musk overhang that gets worse by the day. If it gets worse by the day, he's still looking for upside here at 250. Yeah. I, I so I wouldn't call I this mass capitulation from well, Dan this a, morning, but certainly reflects some of the concerns people have about yeah. that name. Well, it's a readjustment, and we'll have to see how we readjust on a daily basis with Mr. Musk. At Tesla, he's only buying companies with this letter T. Is that right? Yeah, Tesla, Twitter. Is that, is that how it works? Yeah. Where does SpaceX so, fit in? You know, I, well, I don't know. Is that a company? I don't even know. Anyways, let's continue forward here. There's eight themes to talk to Anne-Marie Horton about, and I'm going to touch on the election right now. Anne-Marie, it's really been under the radar, and certainly within our study of economics, finance, investment, it is under the radar, except for the nation, it's not. Whether real or perceived, crime is front and center. Lots of morning after analysis in New York State about how crime was handled by both parties. Mm -hmm. What is your knowledge, your summary of what you learned about crime in America and this election. Well, I think New York for the Democrats is going to be really something they need to dig into as a post-mortem. And for the Republicans, it could potentially be a playbook because what New York is showing that the Republicans were able to really pick up districts that the Democrats and President Biden won by large margins because they were able to really come out and deliver this message on rising prices in New York City and the surrounding areas and across New York State, as well as the concern over crime. So yes, the governor did end up pulling it out and she won the race. But when you look at some of these congressional districts, Nassau County, Hudson Valley, even Repu people voting Republican in places in Queens and Brooklyn. This is something the Democratic yeah. Party is going to have to deal with because this is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, liberal states in the United States. Can there be a centrist aspect to the crime debate on Capitol Hill? Can there be Democrats and Republicans that come together on crime, or is that just unthinkable? I think it potentially can because the Biden administration and President Biden said yesterday he understands concerns with the electorate that inflation and crime is still a major problem. And these are things that he understands people are concerned about. So potentially, even though it was not the red wave and the president wants to keep reminding all the journalists in the room that it was not a red wave, that pundits and some polls were predicting, not all polls, but some polls were predicting that he's going to have to maybe move a little bit more to the center. And he already spoke with Kevin McCarthy last night. So we already are seeing the president do that because these next two years, he does want to get items done on Capitol Hill. Meanwhile, the Republicans perhaps also moving a little bit more to the center in certain aspects. Do you get the sense, Anne-Marie, that more broadly people are blaming Trump for the lack of wins that we saw from Republicans? A lot of people are 
blaming the former president for his picking of candidates that they say just didn't have the credibility or the quality to win, especially Senate statewide races. You think of Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania. And there is a report that the former president is not blaming himself for picking those candidates, even one saying he was putting that blame, no joke, on, on his wife, Melania Trump. Um, you saw the New York Post this morning uh, with their front page really taking aim at the former president. You see the Wall Street Journal this morning with an opinion piece saying that, yes, there was no GOP red wave. It's astonishing that there was not, given the fact that the party in power is dealing with 40-year high inflation. And they also put the blame on the GOP's pick of poor candidates. And that really goes down to the former president and those individuals he backed. Well, the former president told us the rule was going into this, didn't he, Tom? Yes, he, he did. He, he told us. You heard them. If we do well, <laughs> I get the credit. And if we don't, it wasn't my fault. I, when do we hear from him? And yeah, I think you hey, mentioned we'll earlier that, that, that there's a huge push for him to stay out of the dialogue mm -hmm. until after December 6. And I would suggest, John, that's virtually impossible for Mr. Trump. You know, I watched a bit of Fox News yesterday, Tom, just to get the tone of things. And that's what I heard from a lot of people on there, just kind of pushing the former president. So maybe delay I, that I, decision. I, I like I like Libby Cantor. We talked to her yesterday. Oh, she's and, great. And I thought her note this morning with Pimco was just brilliant about this is so seismic, this election, we don't even understand that yet, that you go back to fifty five days after nine eleven and that election. I think she called it a red whisper. Mm -hmm. I think that was her phrase. Well, that may be the phrase, but I think the ramifications there that Anne Marie's talking about, you know, the slice and dice of it, is going to be fascinating. AMH, thank you. Anne Marie down in DC. You know what yesterday in that news conference with the president reminded me of? You know, when you go into an earnings season, say a print for a big tech company, and the bar's really, really low, and they kind of hop over a really low <laughs> bar, and everyone's like, yeah, great story. Great earning story. Yeah. <laughs> Great earning story. You thought it was too positive relative That's to the fact that they still sure. probably are going to lose the House and potentially, and potentially still the even Senate. the Senate. I mean, we don't know. This whole story could change in the next right. couple of weeks I, in Georgia as well in a month from now. The overwhelming nature of it, though, is considered a win. The low bar, to your point. The, the low bar. Yeah. It's about like one <laughs> exactly. of those, those earnings stories where it's like, yeah, terrible the, expectations. They beat estimates. And, the, everyone's like, the, and the stock rallies and everyone's like, yes, we don't need to change a thing. The article <laughs> I want to see is who are the Joe Manchin for the Republicans in a Republican Oh, interesting. I, there's got to be like five or six of them. That would be cool. They will be powerful. Future's up. CPI, an hour away. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. CPI data in America, 60 minutes away. Going into it, equity futures just about positive, up two tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up four tenths of one percent. The rest of the year looks a little something like this. CPI this morning, December 2nd, the payrolls report. The 6th, you should get a runoff in Georgia. Then onto the 13th, the final CPI print of the year. Then onto the 14th, the Federal Reserve, and then we can all go home. Looking forward to that. About a month away. Let's get to the bond market. Twos, tens and thirties. What a year it's been for the bond market from 12 months ago at say in at around 40 basis points to right now on a two year. On a two year Friday came very close to 480. At the moment about 20 basis points south of that number of 459.93. Yields up by a couple of basis points going to this print a little bit later. I think the one we're all watching though just one eye on what happens in the land of Bitcoin. Tom and what happens with crypto. Bitcoin 12 months ago pushing about 70K right now. Let's call it 16. A lot of questions out there on it, John. And of course, crypto uh, will have a special report here. I believe they're working on that uh, 1 right PM now. Eastern. 1 looking PM forward Eastern, to it. really expanding out and really trying to explain this, uh, John, to be honest, to people like me who have no clue what's going on. JP Morgan, Tom, talking about the potential for a cascade of margin calls. And I think we're all trying to work out how much leverage is there and how much contagion can we well, expect, perhaps even across traditional asset classes as well. Right. And that's something we need to probe, get our teeth into over the next couple of days. John, I'm going to editorialize and say there's way, way too much focus on billionaires or less than billionaires and far less focus on people getting run over by this event. Couldn't agree more, Tom. There is going to be so much pain yeah. for individuals across this country and beyond. And that's the point, Tom, where the billionaires you speak of they were billionaires. I've I just no have idea trouble, how John. How much money they've got now? How much hot water uh, they're going to find uh, themselves in over this? We got to move on. But John, I'll, I'll be honest. I've seen the ballet at Davos. It's billionaire adoration. It's gone. Like that. 
gone. Let's cross asset price action. Let's get you some single names. We can do that with Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. Let's talk about the Bitcoin space a little bit more because Please. there are all of these companies that are tied so intimately to the crypto story, including Coinbase. And I'm watching today. It's going up. But yesterday and the day before, huge losses up now 1.2 percent. How much, to John's point, just to build on this idea of the ramifications, the more the broader acceptance of crypto investment in it, how much does that really rebound into other asset classes and potentially cause not the failure of other companies, but, you know, just some real pain that you start to see expressed in market valuation at the very least. In terms of those that are doing well, Rivian, we were talking uh, just earlier, Tom, about who the competitors to Tesla really are. Yeah. Rivian, front and center, the maker of electric uh, vehicles, up more than 8% after reporting faster production than people had been expecting and keeping some of their targets, better than expected guidance. How much do we start to see some of these others gain traction against the likes of Tesla, given how much uh, the technology is advancing and given what's going on right now with all of the controversy around Elon Musk? And Bumble shares lower by 14%. Bumble is the online dating service, Tom. Yes, where I knew that. The uh, woman <clears throat> has to reach out first, yes. not the man. And that was something that gained mm -hmm. traction over the pandemic, now lower by 14% as they post worse than expected earnings. Again, mm -hmm. how many things gained incredible market share during the pandemic, gained incredible amounts of money due to zero rates, now struggling as they face a uh, bleaker reality? Uh, we will see in the bleaker reality again as crypto look for that special broadcast. All the knowledge Bloomberg has this afternoon, uh, an extended uh, conversation on where Bitcoin is at 16,000, 15,000 here a little bit ago. Kathy Jones Jones, now chief fixed income strategist to Charles Schwab. Thrilled she could join this morning. Kathy, I want to get right to the reality. You know I've been on this. I don't care about spreads. I don't care about fancy convexity and the rest of the Frank Fabozzi world. I'm down 15% in some flavor of quality bonds. How do I begin the recovery? Well, yeah, there's a couple of choices you have. So, you know, most likely what you want to do is start reinvesting in higher coupon bonds. So in order to recoup your money, you, you want that coupon money, right? <laughs> because that's what you get out of the bond market. It's much less about capital gains. So obviously, that was when, when yields were falling to zero. But in reality, most income you get from fixed income is the coupon payment. So frankly, to repeat what we had this year and get another 14% down, you'd need rates to go to 9%. Now, I know a lot of bearish people. I don't know anybody talking about 9%. So even in a static or higher interest rate environment, if you have higher coupon paying bonds, mm -hmm. you're going to have a positive total return. What quality of quality corporates is the best positioning point? Is it the no brainer AAA? I, I'm not using that as a credit rating basis, but just the emotional AAA quality, or do you want to go some shades of quality down to find that coupon? Well, in the corporate bond world, there's not a lot of AAA paper out yeah, there anymore. I, I know that. Uh, but you know, you want to stay investment grade. We think um, high yield is it very appealing at nine percent yield. Uh, the problem is we haven't really, I don't think, discounted the weakness in the economy that's coming, and there's probably more shakeout there. So pretty cautious on high yield, but sticking with higher credit quality and and with munis too. For if you're in a higher tax bracket, uh, the muni market still offers some very attractive tax exempt returns. How much are you staying in cash or short-term bonds? I mean, we just heard from Kil Phil Camparelli over at J.P. Morgan, 10% of his portfolio in cash because there is an alternative. Are you finding the same thing in fixed income and avoiding, for example, long duration simply because of the uncertainty right now? Yeah, uh, we're seeing a lot of people, sh you know, stay short, relatively stay short duration. We think that's actually a mistake to stay all in cash because to lock in higher yields right now, we think is an opportunity. We are looking for inflation to come down. We are still looking at a rocky road ahead for the economy. And if you're not locking in some of that income right now, you're probably going to ride ride it up and ride it all the way down and be looking at lower yields down the road. So we're not extending duration to, you know, 
uh, 30 years, but we definitely think it should be moving out to at least an ag-like duration in portfolios. Do you think that longer term, we're going to see an average 10-year yield closer to, say, 3% or even 2%? Is that the more likely kind of target that you're looking at, just to give people an understanding of uh, the rate of change and where we may be headed? Yeah, we do. I think some of the basic fundamentals haven't changed. So, and well, A, we've got some, you know, weakness in the economy coming, just the cumulative effect of all the tightening we've seen globally. We should see the economy uh, continue to weaken and inflation come down. But then we haven't really changed the demographic profile uh, globally and domestically mm -hmm. of an aging population. We still have a lot of savings around the world. And frankly, in the U.S., we still have the world's reserve currency that people flock to when and, you know, things get tough. So I don't know why we wouldn't go back. We get inflation down to around a roughly 3% three, 3 ish 10 year yield. Hey, Kathy, Ira Jersey over at Bloomberg Intelligence just publishes, and he talks about a 10 year yield that will be hovering and that there'll be almost a stasis. Are you assuming we come out of bond volatility and yield volatility towards a hovering sense of the fixed income market? Well, I would love volatility in the bond market to come down, but I think we have to get the Fed to slow down or uh, stabilize before that happens. I think one of the concerns I have is that this, this volatility, this rate of change has been so dramatic and so high that it's kind of destabilizing a lot of other things. So, you know, because bonds are used to price other assets, if you have a highly volatile treasury market, you can't really price those assets very well. So I think down the road, sure, we should get lower volatility, but I think we need to see the Fed plateau at least before that's going to happen. Kathy, awesome. One of the best, as always. Kathy Jones, they have Charles Schwab. Tom, 400 basis points in eight months. 400 basis points in eight months from well, this Federal Reserve. And, what know, did we get in the last tightening hey, cycle across three years? If Half of that? Yes. If you're on the right side of this, you're a genius. But I would say that's a very narrow group. And again, you know, not to not to compare and contrast with Bitcoin. They're two different. They're not even apples and oranges. Sure. But you've got this idea of a lot of people who face some real loss. And it's, the index, Lisa, to negative 15%. There's not much difference for a bond retiree from negative 6% and negative 15%. They're both equally painful. It's brutal. It's been a it's been a difficult year, and one of the key questions is when is the sixty forty going to come back? When are bonds going to actually act as some kind of counter cyclical uh, counterbalance to risk assets? Think... Yeah, there's some people who are suggesting that perhaps the second half of next year. I forgot where I was reading a, a number of analysts pointing to then as possibly seeing some sort of counterbalance from the ten year yield, but we haven't seen it reliably yet. Yeah, so yeah, I think you can make that argument now relative to twelve months, just for the fact because yields are so much higher. The question I have off the back of 400 basis points of tightening in eight months is the price you're going to pay for that, a 21% move on the S&P 500. Yeah. Is that it? We're done. 400 basis points <clears> of tightening and the price you pay is 21% on the S&P. How do you even game that out when you don't understand you what the consequences are going to be of a 5% Fed funds rate? And to that point, this is basically just throwing darts at a dartboard, which is the reason why Phil Camparelli has 10% of his yeah. portfolio in cash. Totally. I'm not cynical. I mean, I just don't not at think all. so. But I just got an email that the wonderful That's Dan funny. Ives, who we're trying to effort, is on a plane. And I just wondered if Elon was putting him on SpaceX to enjoy going up oh, in right. space. Just sending him back Elon up Elon caught up. Dan, we could put you on SpaceX Stay this there. morning. Stay there. Stay there. Dan Ives can't join us this morning. That's unfortunate. We'll catch up with him another time, Tom. And he will publish. And there's a lot to talk about. You know, you, we haven't talked much about China today, but I think the Apple China update is a great story into the end of the year. Ives is out front on that. Look, the supply chain risk in China is real and has been for the last and, 12 and months. You've alluded in the last couple of days it's come back towards quarantine, COVID, etc. I just think for Apple it's such a delicate dance because it's a huge production base. It's also a huge source of demand, and do you want to risk yeah. the blowback of exiting the country? And I've talked about some unsustainable situations with some multinationals, and we're getting towards decision time. Well, decision time by who? <clears throat> Is it going to be government regulators that start coming in and saying, guys, not so much? Or do you start to get just the desire to, ha to avoid some of the reputational risk? Do you know who called this election <clears throat> really well? Terry Haynes of yeah. Pangea going to join us shortly. Looking forward to that. Terry, the founder of Pangea Policy, coming up from New York City. This is Bloomberg. 
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Figures out today are likely to show that U.S. inflation moderated only slightly last month, and that's keeping a fifth straight 75 basis point rate hike on the table for the Fed's meeting next month. Economists forecast that the consumer price index will show a 7.9% increase on an annual basis. The CPI comes out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. President Biden says he still plans to seek re-election and will likely make it official early next year. The president spoke after Democrats avoided worst-case scenario congressional losses in midterm elections. He said the final decision on running again depends on his health discussions and depends on his health and discussions with his family. Well, British Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt is considering whether to impose the top income tax rate on more Britons. Bloomberg's learned Hunt is thinking about lowering the 172,000 threshold at which the 45% tax rate is paid. Hunt and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak are looking for more than 57 billion of spending cuts and tax hikes. Analysts say that Meta Platform's first major job cuts won't be nearly enough to get the company back to being as profitable as it was two years ago. The parent of Facebook laid off 11,000 workers Wednesday. Still, revenue is falling, spending has ballooned, and the money saved on job cuts equals just one point of operating margin. And it was the largest single owner art auction in history. In just two and a half hours Wednesday night, Christie's presided over the sale of just 60 artworks for an unprecedented $1.5 billion. Now, they came from the collection of late Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. Among them were works from Lucian Freud, Gustav Klimt, and Paul Cezanne. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. This slow return to normal levels of inflation could threaten the stability of inflation expectations. And if there's one thing we learned in the 70s is that the Fed cannot let inflation fester and expectations rise. If we back off for fear of a downturn, inflation comes back even stronger and requires even more restraint. The Fed speak is back in a big way, and you're going to get a ton of it a little bit later after CPI in America. That CPI print, 42 minutes away. Equities look like this on the S&P 500 going into that print. Just about positive through much of this morning on the S&P, on the Nasdaq as well. On the S&P 500, we are higher by two-tenths of 1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, just north of 4%. Let's call it 4.1% on a 10-year this morning. Talked about that call from Dan Ives of Wedbush. Kind of gets price target on Tesla from 300 down to 250. Yeah. In the pre-market, we're at one. 77. He added to the call on Twitter. He said this, Tom, we still believe in the long term bullish thesis on Tesla. That view is unchanged. But this Twitter madness needs to end. Brand destruction is our biggest worry with this Twitter circus show. It's that simple. And, and it I comes can't over ignore to Tesla. it yeah. for Tesla stock. Yeah. Yeah. His view. It's going to be interesting. We're going to move on right now, but I'm going to go to John Farrell here to frame out our next guest. This is important, John, and you alluded to it. What an election to speak to Terry Haynes. He has a certain perspective. He got it right. He just got it right going into all of this. Everyone was looking for that massive red wave. It dominated the conversations on this show, and that's not what Terry was looking for. Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy, joins us right now. Terry, why don't you start with what you were looking for and why, and we'll take it from there. Uh, good morning, John. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of old school. I, I, I look at the data as much as possible. I weigh in a bunch of other things. Uh, I do pay attention to uh, what some of the aggregators are, are, are looking at, whether it be, uh, you know, Real Clear Politics or uh, uh, Nate Silver's site or whatever uh, as kind of a spice. Uh, but I've been, uh, been around this and doing this a long time. And in the end, uh, what you get from me is my own view. I wasn't seeing a wave. I was seeing a uh, you know a slight reddening of the map, certainly, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, probably a small House majority, and uh, you know the Senate's still up for grabs. But I think uh, right. right now a little more likely to go R than D. Uh, but it wasn't going to happen. So you know, I mean, what you get out of this is you know you get continued what you already have: continued fiscal right. stability. Nothing in the domestic and uh, continued unanimity on foreign policy. Terry, will there be a set of Joe Manchins in the House? Will there be centrist Republicans looking to 2024 that will push against more conservative Republicans a la Joe Manchin and the Democrats in the Senate? 
Oh, sure. And well, there already are, you know, Mansion by no means is alone. Everybody knows Mansion and Cinema, but yeah, I, I always look at them and, and know that they're they're representing others on issues, whether it be energy issues or, you know, frankly, the regulation of financial services. Right. Uh, because remember, they've rejected a bunch of people. Th those people exist in the House as well. So sure. These are four factions, not two parties, I always say. And, and that's still true. Well, this is really important. I don't think it's in the zeitgeist right now, Terry. It's not a unified GOP in the House. I get that. But do they have real power to steer GOP legislation with a GOP majority in the House? Well, if if they can uh, unify around some things, sure. And there will be lots of you know responsible people. Uh, Patrick McHenry and uh, financial services uh, being one uh, who will look to do that exactly. But it won't be an easy process for them, just like it wasn't an easy process for Democrats in the last cycle. Uh, you know, it'll take some time. It won't be instantaneous. Uh, and of course, uh, if the Senate does not go, whether or not the Senate goes Republicans way, you need 60 votes to uh, to proceed to legislation in the Senate, they won't have anywhere near that. So the net net of that is you won't see very much legislation be successful. Terry, is it too soon to say that Ron DeSantis is the new leader of the Republican Party? Um, no, probably not, Lisa. It's probably not too soon to say that. Uh, you know, certainly the, uh, the direction that DeSantis points, uh, which is, you know, kind of unapologetic on policy while at the same time having uh, having a winning way about him not only uh, personally but uh, but through election results uh, is exactly the direction the party wants to go in and uh, and so sure I think that's probably true from a substance perspective how does that differ from Donald Trump uh, from a what perspective I'm Sub sorry. from a substance perspective oh substance perspective um I think uh, what what it how it changes is that kind of consistency of purpose and consistency of message. Uh, what always dogged uh, former President Trump was uh, was was a lack of consistency in messaging and and a lack of consistency in substance to some extent. Now there were he had some successes where he was uh, laser sharp on both of those, uh, China tariffs being one. But a lot of other things, uh, the Trump White House is a little bit all over the map, and that was bad for them. Uh, DeSantis has shown in his governorship that he's he he's learned from that. Terry, Tom's talked about this. I just want to build on it a little bit more to close out this conversation. The failure to embrace men in voting on the Republican side. Terry, how do they address that? How do they even talk about it in the coming months? Uh, the, the what, John? I'm sorry. The, the failure the to embrace mail-in votes on the Republican side. Oh, yeah. It just hasn't been part uh, no, of the strategy for the party. Uh, that, Why not? Yeah, um, that's strange, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, they're, they're going to have to. Uh, and I, this is probably a wake-up call for that. I, I don't know why they've been late to the post on that, but they have been. Uh, but they're going to have to figure out that there's really two uh, two elections here, the mail-in vote election and the day-of-vote election. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania is a perfect example of that. I could never understand why uh, why, Republic, or why Oz agreed to debate veterans so late after there were so many mm -hmm. uh, votes already starting. And uh, they're already in, and that's probably right. what election against him. Terry, so, yeah, they yeah. have to do something different. Terry, don't feel bad that you didn't understand John. I didn't understand him either there. You know, like about every fifth word with John, I just, with the accent, I just, I don't, I didn't get the mail-in thing there as well. It wasn't just Sh you. Should I go home? No, it's just like a Peaky Blinders thing. I have to watch what the captions on <laughs> No, I did not understand what John said there, as Terry said the same thing, the accent. You're suggesting that was a Brummie accent. No, I need, I, well, I should I get it here. Perfectly. Now that I think about it, I need to get, a t uh, you know, the, the word thing at the bottom of the screen. Closed captions. Closed captions. I do that with Pinky Blinders. I mean, I have no idea He didn't no understand me saying. either, and I Ted didn't Lasso? have an accent. Well, yeah, but, you know, but no, that's, that's fair. I need closed caption for Bloomberg surveillance with John Farrow. I mean, Just there's no question about it. Figuring out how offended I should be. <laughs> I think right quite. Now. I think quite. I think you're justified being quite. Mail but let's in. talk about shelter. Mail-in voting. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. Just Terry, hugely thank you. valuable. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. Would you like to take us to break? No, 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 please. No, no, please no. do. No, I, please. I'd hate I for insist. people to fail to understand my, my Birmingham accent. Is, it, is that to... Birmingham? I did not know this, that. What's is, the difference between a Birmingham a and a Manchester Birmingham accent? Birmingham accent. They sound different. They're, they're, like, radically different, right? Sure, a couple Seriously. of hours away, but they sound different, yeah. Who has a Manchester accent we talked to? Is Jim O'Neill? Is he?
Not really. I mean, this is to. getting incredibly I uncomfortable. Can I just say? Well, I, 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 I don't know. But in America, Lisa, we don't have the accent variants. Like, you know, the difference between you and me is not that much. And yet mm. you, how far is Birmingham to Manchester? A couple of hours. A couple of hours. It's like another yeah. world. Where are we going with this? I don't know. A mail and mail, you know, I, I struggled with it like Terry did. I mean, it's okay. Matt it's like Ted Lasso. is going to join us shortly. I might not be here. Well, we'll see. I might no. not be here. I might just Futures up eight. Dow futures up 50. Take us the break. Oh, no, I can't. Please do. Don't do that. No. no, no, please. CPI, 35 minutes. This market is showing that it's discounted most of what expecting. When it comes to the tightening, the Fed is obviously the most important factor globally. Everyone waiting for that Fed pivot. The Fed wants to be more dovish, but will inflation let the Fed you know, make that shift? Inflation may have peaked, but boy, the descent is going to be gradual. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Key, 30 minutes away from an important inflation report that could move markets. John, it's important, and you mentioned on to December, another inflation study before the Fed meeting. Yeah, whatever we talk about in about 30 minutes' time, I imagine the story could well change going into the Fed meeting. So we have two more prints, one today, one December 13th, and the Fed meeting on December 14th, which comes with a set of projections, and we've got to work out what they think. 2023 and beyond looks like what's the angst here how about this off the pandemic low on a gallon of gas we're up 105 percent even with a pullback in a gallon of gas john in the last 12 months a gallon of gas even with a pullback up 11 percent that's going to be a story for headline inflation for core it comes down to shelter and the problem that this <clears throat> fed has and i think the problem we have following this story is that 12 months ago it was goods inflation it was the supply side story it was the pandemic 12 months later, it spread to services, to shelter. And that's why it's stickier, broader, and slightly more problematic. And as Terry Haynes just said, Lisa, with the election, it's local and shelter is local. We're all colored by the New York City idiocy. The market here is surreal. But across the nation, there's a surreal element to it. Local, not just with respect to domicile, but also with respect to income. And what you're seeing, even in the United States, even in New York City, you're seeing the luxury apartments going for bidding wars, whereas the rest of the universe of apartments are languishing. And there's a real divergence emerging, and you're seeing that around the country right now. Add it up. I mean, it makes out a third of inflation shelter. That's the general guideline. Then you overlay on food, which I think is 8, 9, 10%, whatever that number is. It's a ginormous part of the paycheck. Honestly, this has been a big issue. You know, we've been talking about how this isn't going to matter until the next CPI print. I they won't do it. anything with it. one CPI print. So I'm trying to parse out everyone who's going to trade on this today with all the people who are then going to tell us that it doesn't really matter and that we have to look till December. Yeah. You know, I mean, but that's really been I'm what happens there. every Show single time. Are. I think that's always the way it is. That's always the way it will be. What we're trying to work out here, more importantly, is we look around the world right now, we can see inflation is rolling over. You can see evidence of it everywhere. You can see the labour market cracking in places as well. We just haven't seen it reach the official aggregate data in quite the same way. And so that's the problem. Let, let's get to the data check, and I'm going to go to the two-year yield, 4.60%. John, what does the two-year yield do off this inflation report? Well, it was curious on Friday off the back of the payrolls report. We threatened to break 480 yeah. and then bracked away. And we're in and around 460 right now. Who knows? Tick you push the terminal Boom. rate much higher than it already is. The Fed has already told you that they're going to go slower but further with Fed funds. And that's my question, really. How much scope is there to push the terminal rate much higher than it already is? You almost need the inflation I, story to accelerate, I think, to engineer that kind of problem. I agree with that. The acceleration could be up or down. And what no one's looking for today is a tick up in inflation. I mean, you know, a small tick up in inflation would be big news. But we've constantly misread this all year. In yes. fact, for the last 18 months. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's been the story of the year, Tom. I'm going to start with dollar churning here. I don't think it's just pulled back as much as I'm getting in the zeitgeist here. DXY from what, John? A 112, 113 rounded up. We're back to 111. It's a little bit of a dollar. Euro pullback. dollar's been camped out near parity yeah. for the last week or so. <clears throat> it's there right now. 99.45 on euro dollar, negative six tenths of 1%. Futures, Tom, up 11 points on the S&P, up a third of 1%. 
We'll have to see. That's all there is uh, to it. Joining us now, Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer, Parima. Well, Patrick, what will you look for in 26 minutes? In 26 minutes, it's it's going to be the direction of services and shelter is going to be the swing. I think uh, economists have a good handle on where goods prices are. Commodities have rolled over. So um, it's a little bit harder to forecast, and it creates a bit more of a wild card. But shelter is the biggest contributor and uh, the general direction of non-energy services. Patrick, help us explore the question we were probing just moments ago. How much scope is there for a higher terminal rate at the Fed, as far as you're concerned, based on what's priced already? I just can't see it unless the U.S. economy really surprises to the upside next year because my base case has the U.S. economy slowing, flirting with a recession, probably falling into a mild recession, and that's going to come with job losses that the Fed has, the Fed hikes have created. I don't see how the Fed is going to be willing to keep hiking um, when joblessness starts rising. So um, job situation is really robust in America right now. If you do fall into a recession, that's going to change. And I don't see the Fed getting past 5% unless something changes, some exogenous shock that pushes the economy forward. I, I just don't see that happening. Are you getting exhausted parsing through all of these reports to try to get some sense of the thesis even going forward to even craft some narrative for 2023? Yeah, I think um, you can get into the minutia a little bit on each month-on-month -month inflation print, but you've got to look for longer-term trends. And what's happened is you've seen no deceleration from the services side of things. Um, shelter keeps going up. Uh, mortgage costs are going up. So if uh, you're a landlord, you want to pass on those higher mortgage costs and rent costs to uh, rent as well. So I think looking for direction and rate of change in those things will be the, the leader of inflation. And I think the Fed probably does pause before it hits its target, just because um, as inflation is falling, probably the U.S. economy is weakening. Um, you've got to look at it, but it's the direction of change and movement in uh, the individual subcomponents that matters. I keep thinking about what Phil Camparelli over at J.P. Morgan said earlier on the show, where he said that he, since uh, the summer, he's been building his cash positioned 10 percent of his portfolio, the most he's ever had. Have you been making similar moves since the summer, since we got some indication from the Fed that they were planning for perhaps a higher terminal rate than previously expected? I've not gone into cash. I love short duration credit, so it's not quite cash. But um, on triple B plus, um, single A minus corporate bonds from banks, you're getting a 6% yield to maturity. And I think there's next to non-existent default risk on these big banks. And you're getting a, a premium to what the two-year yield is. So um, cash gives you something now. It didn't give you anything. But I think short-duration corporate bonds give you a little bit better bang for your buck. And I'm really attracted to that right now. Patrick, what is the unlovedness of stocks right now? Exactly how gloomy is the market? And is that an opportunity? I think that's probably the upside catalyst. And at the end of September, everyone was completely gloomy. And that set the stage for a really strong October rally. I think um, market sent sentiments dictated by price. And uh, as the market's ri risen since the end of September, people are still pessimistic, but probably not as much as they were at the end of September. So I think general pessimism, anything that's bad, but not quite as bad as people expect, may be setting the floor under um, equities and risk assets. So today after we get CPI, we're going to hear from Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, and Kansas City Fed, uh, Fed President Esther George. Who matters to you? Do you listen to this Fed speak? Does it actually color your view? Definitely colors the view. They've all got their own agendas and the views on where policy should go. Um, and I think we're going to probably get hawkish rhetoric out of the Fed for the coming few months. Um, they'll really want to show that they've got a handle on inflation because they know when the economy gets tough, um, they want to front load things and basically fight inflation now while they can, while the job market's still strong. So even if the Fed it is going to pivot, they're not going to talk about a pivot right now. And Patrick, just a final question from me. It's something we've been thinking about more and more over the last couple of weeks. Can you really deliver 400 basis points of hikes in eight months? and then say that the price was just a 20, 25% move in the S&P 500. Patrick, I just take a step back from it all sometimes and look at the screens. I'm just wondering where the pain really is. Is this it or is this the, the calm before the storm? I'm, I'm 
I'm cautiously optimistic on equities right now. The multiples, um, the Fed's destroyed the multiples on equity markets. Um, the earnings outlook is the risk. Um, if you can find companies that have resilient profit margins and can defend those profit margins, I'm a buyer of those kind of companies right now. So I like energy. I like luxury companies. The overall index as a whole is going to face a lot of headwinds. There's not going to be massive rallies, but companies that deliver earnings growth, you've already had the multiple contractions, so earnings will drive stock prices. Patrick, thank you, sir. As always, Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi Wealth. The headwinds at the index level, at least we've had that conversation how many times now over the last week or so? Yeah, how many well, times, seriously, again and again? Yeah, well, and this really comes down to tech, right? This really comes down to what we're seeing. I saw there was this one article about how Amazon is the first company to have lost a trillion dollars of market value. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it built it up over the past three years, four years. Now it just was taken away in a heartbeat. How much do we see that really bleed into and really create? I hate to talk about the lost decade. People will come out with gloomy, you know, I think it's fine to talk about that. We should have that conversation. They're not unheard of. Yeah, I, I agree. Exist. And that's what some people are expecting. And we've just had a decade of excess in one specific sector, and we've got to work out how quickly it takes to bounce how back quickly, from that. How quickly is the key for reshape quickly. industry. they got to move at light speed. Media, when it comes to light speed. eyeballs, ads, clicks, all of that stuff light that speed. Facebook built. Yeah. Are we blowing that up? I, I, how far I, does it go? I totally agree, John. And the operative word there is quickly. They've got to move at light speed. Jennifer Epstein out with this inflation report in 20 minutes, 19 minutes, John. I am stunned by this. Take out the fancy people. The average rent in Manhattan is 38.50, and the income calculation to pay $3,850 a month is you need 154,000 in income. That's how twisted. This inflation is granted. Looking at an odd market of New York City. Well, let's reframe that. Who are the fancy <clears throat> people? Because for a lot of people across this country, if you need one hundred and fifty-four thousand a year Income. and your rent's thirty-eight fifty, you're part of the fancy. You're people. part of the fancy people, and we're it's not even money. doing that within our Bloomberg article. Like the the the, uh, the other part of fancy is shocking. Top ten percent luxury fancy stuff is thirteen still thousand a month. Still climbing. Up 13%. Yeah. It's surreal. And, you know, we, we, we lose scope and scale every day on this. Uh, well, we're lucky we have you to bring us back down to earth and I'm, I am. get us in touch with the common man. I am. Matt Lazzetti. Here we are. The Deutsche Bank's going to join us next. <laughs> Live from New York City, CPI, 19 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, in control of the U.S. Senate, it comes down to three races where votes are still being counted. Each party needs to win two of those states to secure a majority. Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada are still in play. And the race in Georgia is headed to a runoff next month. Neither Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock nor Republican Herschel Walker have received 50% of the vote. Meanwhile, some Republican leaders are moving on from Donald Trump and are embracing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as the party's best hope for the White House. DeSantis was re-elected Tuesday and racked up votes in Democratic strongholds. At the same time, some of the former President Trump's favored candidates suffered humiliating defeats in House and Senate races. The Pentagon estimates well over 100,000 Russian soldiers have been killed or wounded during the war in Ukraine. The chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Mark Milley, also estimates that there have been 40,000 Ukrainian civilian casualties. Milley says that a potential stalemate in fighting over the winter could lead to peace talks. In China, the government has once again reiterated its support for the COVID-0 policy. Still, it's urging more precise and targeted control measures against the virus. According to the state-run news agency, Beijing will try to minimize the impact on economic and social developments. And new Twitter owner Elon Musk has emailed his staff for the first time and warned them of, quote, difficult times ahead. Musk wrote that there's no way to sugarcoat the message about the economic outlook. He also said remote work will no longer be allowed and employees are expected to be in the office for at least 40 hours a week. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I 
I think inflation may have peaked, but boy, the descent is going to be gradual and it's going to be far from steady. Um, I think at the end of the day, you're looking at key components, which are now sort of the cat is out of the bag. They are significantly higher. How sticky is inflation going to be on the way back down? That was Lara Rain. Brilliant, as always, the chief U.S. economist at FS Investments. Your CPI print, 12 minutes away. Here's the state of play in the market. Equities marginally higher through most of this morning on the S&P, up a third of 1%. Yields marginally lower, down two basis points on a 10-year to 4.07%. And the dollar is slightly stronger against the weaker euro. Tom, euro dollar, 99.51. Let's get right to it here again with futures of 13. Matt Lazzetti joins chief U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank with a really important call on recession out front of so many others. We're thrilled he could join us here for an extended time uh, through this uh, call in 12 minutes. The language is sufficiently restrictive. What will you learn about sufficiently restrictive here in 11 minutes? Yeah, first, thank, thanks so much for having me. It's good to be actually in person. Um, you know, I think in terms of sufficiently restrictive, we, we know a lot of the inflation data is lagging. I think that the Fed certainly um, t took account of that in their last FOMC statement, talking about the lagged effects and the cumulative tightening that they've done. And that that's kind of an independent condition, I think, when they're thinking about stepping down. I think in terms of sufficiently restrictive, when you look at the economy overall, we haven't seen the labor market really slow materially at all. It's still incredibly tight. The persistent elements of the inflation data remain very elevated. Um, and I, th I think when you look at the U.S. economy, trackers for GDP in Q4 are bouncing back, particularly with auto sales picking up. So I, I don't know that we're going to learn too much about sufficiently restrictive with this morning's data. Uh, I think it's going to take time. That doesn't mean the Fed doesn't necessarily step down in December. Um, but I think we're going to have to see more jobs reports. We're going to see, need to see more jolts reports. And importantly, we need to see what's happening with the consumer. Why can't it fall as quickly as it rose? That's what a lot of people are asking. What is it about this inflation story that prevents that from happening? I think the nature of it has just changed incredibly over the past year. So the, the initially, it was narrowly confined. It was about a few items, and it was about supply-constrained items. So everybody talked about used car prices as being the, the key driver. Today, it is so broad-based. You know, what I tend to look at at the end of this day is what is trim mean telling us? What is median CPI telling us? Those are good measures of broad-based uh, inflation, and those have been very elevated. And so I think what you've seen is it's in the services items. We know rent and OER are going to be persistent. Some of these other items within the service basket we also think is, are going to be persistent. And it's also consistent with a labor market today that is, that is very tight. Unit labor cost growth trend is, is, is very negative. Matt, you know what the next question will be, I think anyway. What would you say to the people watching, listening right now who say, Matt, I'm seeing a different story. I'm seeing layoffs at big companies. I'm seeing price declines in retail because of inventory. I'm seeing freight get absolutely hammered in a way that is just completely divorced from the story of 12 months ago. What do you say to those people? Yeah, so I think we all expect that we're going to be seeing it in the goods data. So, you know, what I would look for today is, are we seeing household furnishings coming off apparel? Are we seeing good broad-based goods deflation? I think that's the first indicator that we need to see to get confidence that that's actually going to show up in the, in the inflation data. You know, I think what we've heard from a lot of the companies is uh, consumers are not as price sensitive as they were before. They can still pass through price increases. And I think from the labor market side, you know, I don't want to overemphasize what we're seeing with, you know, big tech. Sure. Uh, it doesn't represent the U.S. economy. Um, I think when you look at the JOLTS data, certainly the initial jobless claims data, everything looks tight. So it's a labor market that still looks very tight on most metrics. I'm looking right now at the Cleveland Fed nowcast for inflation, which a lot of people have said has really been dead on consistently. And it still has basically an eight handoff for November CPI. And I'm thinking, yeah, it'll take time, but the Fed doesn't have a luxury of time. And given how slowly it's coming down, is the Fed destined to basically break the back of this economy because there is no other way to do it other than to raise rates further and hold them there for longer? Yeah, we think so. I mean, I mean, it's a question of what do you think the nature of the inflation data is today? Can it? Can we get back closer, much closer to the Fed's target with the unemployment rate only rising to 4.4% 4, 4 as, the, as the Fed is looking at? You know, the, the research that we've been doing suggests no. I think you're going to need to see a much sharper rise in the unemployment rate uh, I don't think that the labor market can come into better balance simply by job openings coming down. I think the evidence is that as job openings come down across the board, we are going to see layoffs pick up and, and the unemployment rate rise, and that that is the most likely path and the most um, reliable path, I think, to, to getting price stability. Can we tie in the, the election? I know a lot of people are sort of shrugging it off as a non-event, but it does raise the inability for this government to really create a fiscal response to counterbalance anything. And we've been talking about that for a while now. How much does that 
affect the duration of the downturn that you're expecting, as well as the depth? Yeah, I think there's two things. One, we should look at the economy today. There's still a lot of latent stimulus out there. So you look at household balance sheets with somewhere between 1.75 and 2 trillion of accumulated excess savings. We have state and local governments that are actually stimulating meaningfully today. We, we wrote a piece about at least $30 billion of stimulus checks from state and local governments. And so I think that there is still a lot of latent stimulus. From my perspective, that tells us that the economy is going to be more resilient in the near term. The Fed has to keep raising rates. But then I think you're absolutely right. On the other side of this, if we do get the recession, it does mean that, that no doubt fiscal policy is going to be less responsive. We think monetary policy is likely going to be less responsive given persistent inflation. And then you have the tail risks about the debt ceiling and does that bring actually fiscal retrenchment back in. So that's, that's the tail risk that I think the market is certainly focused on. Do you know how much we like you? We like you so much we gave you Mike McKee's seat. Mike McKee. It's about a million miles in that direction, and I can just about see him. Morning, Mike. Walk us through the numbers you're going to be looking at in about seven minutes' time. Morning, John. Uh, well, we're looking for a slight increase in the headline number, up by four-tenths uh, or uh, six-tenths uh, on the month after four-tenths the prior month because, basically, energy. Uh, the core, though, is expected to drop uh, a little bit, five-tenths increase from six-tenths. Now, those are not going to be great improvements, but I do want to point out that I, I'm not looking at the year-over-year -year numbers because that includes data from 12 months ago. It's what the Fed wants to see is the sequential decline in the month-over-month -month numbers, and certainly if you're looking at the core, you're not seeing that yet. If we get even a drop to five-tenths, that's a, still a big increase, and it's still something the Fed is going to be worried about because this is a, would only be the first drop in right. several months. 20 seconds, Mike, because we got to go. What is this item you're going to look at besides shelter? Uh, oh, I'm going to look at service prices. I think Matt uh, has exactly okay. the right view there. Goods prices are going to come down. Sh uh, service prices are going to be the real issue. And then we take that apart to see, mm -hmm. is there something in there the Fed can actually influence? Mike McKee, thank you. That's a big debate at the end there, Tom. Big debate. Can they influence what we're seeing? We'll talk to Lizetti about this later after we see the numbers. The three of us, quickly, what does inflation subside down to? Headline inflation. To me, 5%. That's totally unacceptable. If we get down to 4 or 5, do we have a different conversation at the Federal Reserve? They're not going to keep on hiking until we see two. They're going to well, keep on hiking until they're convinced that we're on a downward trajectory <clears throat> back down towards target. And Lisa, I don't know how much data they need, how much information they need to be convinced of that. For now, they're going to keep sure. hiking until they get down to two. What happens if you start to see the dual mandate come into question a little bit more and you start mm -hmm. to see unemployment rise to some of these levels? Then do they say, well, you know, we don't want to cause undue pain to the economy and we understand I don't think the risks? See that. I don't think you're going to see that. They certainly aren't going to message pain. that now. They're not, I That's guess. not what they want to signal. But I mean, what I they want the to vector. signal is different to what they may well do. You're right about the vector. That's about, why it's yeah, difficult being long equities at the moment for many people because this Fed wants to signal such a hawkish policy stance, even into an economy that many people anticipate will roll over. They're basically saying, please go down. Stocks, please go down. <laughs> Chairman Powell said as much, right? Yeah, pretty Last much. Week. From New York, CPI up next. This is Bloomberg. Inflation data in America seconds away. Going into that data, equity futures up a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Breaking down the data for us, let's get over to Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, it comes in pretty much as forecast, except a little bit lower on the headline number. Uh, headline and core come in lower than forecast. So this is a good report. It's going to be interesting to see how the market reacts. CPI on a month-over-month -month basis up four-tenths, pushes <laughs> the year-over-year -year number to 7.7%. That's down from 8.2. Uh, the core comes in up three-tenths. The forecast was for five-tenths, and that pushes the year-over-year -year to 6.3 from 6.6. .6. So a significant improvement in the data that wasn't expected by the markets. What's interesting is the last six or seven months, the numbers have come in stronger than expected. This is the first time we've seen something that's been actually a little bit worse, uh, a little bit lower than expected. So good news there. Uh, what uh, what are the markets?
market's doing, John, while I look at the uh, numbers for the individual categories? Exploding higher, Mike, Exploding. as you might expect. Yeah. So big downside surprise on CPI, a welcome downside surprise on CPI. Equity market's up 2.5% on the S&P 500. Once I've told you that, you can guess where the bond market is. At the front end of the curve, <laughs> we're down 19 basis points. On Friday, shortly after payrolls, we had a look at 480, at 479. We're back down to 439. Yeah. On a 10 year time, we're down 12 basis I, points, 397. I'll let you do the math, John. I'm going to say this. I have never, and I mean never, seen the equity market futures move like Explode that, high like that off of first print. I've <laughs> what never move. seen that lift. We'll get you the intraday charts up. If you want another intraday chart this morning, just check out any currency pair with the dollar <laughs> on the other side of it. Euro dollar up six tenths of 1%. So you've got a much, much stronger euro and across the board in G10, a weaker dollar off the back of this. So downside surprise on CPI, equities up, yields lower, dollar weaker. Mike McKee, you've had an extra few minutes. Break down the composition of this one for us. Well, it's kind of interesting. We did see gasoline prices rise by 4.4% uh, 4. Uh, 4 on the month, which is no surprise. The big declines come in used cars. We finally got that one into the system, down 2.4%. Apparel down 7 tenths of a percent. That was expected as well. Shelter costs go up by 8 tenths. That is more. Uh, than we've seen in the last three months. Rent up seven tenths and owner's equivalent rent up six tenths. So housing still contributing, although the owner's equivalent is down a little bit from the prior month's eight tenths rise. Uh, airline fares down 1.1%. Motor vehicle insurance still continues its rise up 1.7%. Right. So we're seeing the categories that we anticipated, particularly on the good side, going down. <coughs> categories on the services side still rising some. The bad news, and Tom will appreciate this, um, is it's going to be a long, cold winter, it looks like, in New England, and not because the Red Sox were terrible. Fuel oil up 19.8%. Yeah. That, that yeah. is an issue. Stephen Shork's been brilliant on that for us here, the challenges in the Northeast. Michael McKee, how does this report change the Fed speak Lisa's reported on that we see today? I don't think it changes it at all because it is, first you go back to this standard disclaimer in economics of one month's data don't make a trend. But it does tell them they're sort of in the right direction. So it sort of underscores the idea that maybe they can take a a, a bit of a, I don't know what the word to use is. I don't think it's a pivot to go down to 50 basis points. That's still a lot. Step down. But, but they could do that step down to 50 basis points. Thank you, Lisa. Oh. And uh, they'd be justified uh, in the market's view. And I think that's what we'll see over the next couple of weeks. Now, we got a lot of Fed speak today. So we will get a pretty instantaneous reaction to what's happened. How much are we looking at the areas that did decelerate or didn't accelerate quite as much as people had expected that those kinds of decelerations would continue, Mike? I mean, is there a sense of any kind of trend in any of the areas that you've been parsing through? Uh you can't. Th that's the problem. You can't really uh, call it a trend. There isn't anything that uh, has been consistently uh, going down. But with the uh, supply chain starting to normalize, we should see that going forward. Food uh, up six tenths. It was up eight tenths the past two months. So maybe that's the beginning of a trend, especially with the Ukraine grain uh, shipments continuing. Uh, but uh, we're going to have to wait and see for a while on uh, on all this. I think. I think you can probably anticipate that goods prices are going to continue to go down. Um, Matt mentioned earlier uh, some of the construction supplies and household goods, uh, furniture and bedding down 1.2 percent, uh, window coverings down 1.2 percent, floor coverings down 1.4 percent. A lot of that furniture comes from China, and so maybe uh, that suggests that we're seeing a bit of an improvement in supply chains as uh, inventories build up. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. As always, there is a hope this morning off the back of that data point that this is the beginning of something. To Mike's point, December 13th is your next CPI print. A day later, you get a Fed decision and a whole set of projections. This morning, at least, we're backing away, backing right away from the idea that the Fed's going to go 75 basis points again yeah. after that print, Tom. We talked about equities exploding higher on the S&P by 2.8% now on the Nasdaq 100 much, much higher off the back of this and yield to the front end of the curve down almost 20 basis points on a two year. So, TK, to your point, 
When did we last see a move that large? An in explosion. In I, I really can't. In, big, big in, move. In umpteen years I've been doing this, I think I had the third Bloomberg. And when Mike and Tom Secunda made it up, I've never seen that pop. Ever, 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 ever. Down 20 basis points yeah. on a two-year. On a 10-year, down 15. And the dollar a whole lot weaker. We're not going to show the chart right now because we don't want to waste a second with Matthew Lozetti, chief U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank. But, Matt, I look at core CPI, and you got to be kidding me. This is, you know, the, to use a fancy phrase that David Folkert's Landau would use, this is a teen-tweens move and a turnaround. There's no way there's a vector here. So on the path, it's 6.3% core. What number do you need to see where you have John Farrow's vector of disinflation? Yeah, so I, I think we shouldn't overemphasize the 0 03 We've seen that a few times over the past year and a half. But I think when you do look at the underlying elements of this data, it, it, there is some support there. So owner's equivalent rent coming off a little bit. Uh, we saw health insurance inflation come down, which was anticipated. You're seeing some of the goods deflation as we, we were, you know, everybody anticipates that we were going to see. Apparel prices down, used cars everybody knew was going to be down, household furnishings coming off. So I think the underlying elements of this report are actually, you know, they're, they're good. They're supportive. There's, you know, some evidence that we are moving from peak inflation down okay, lower. Where, where do we end up, I think, is, is the big question. But to John's point on vector six-ish core inflation, at what point do you say, yeah, the arrow's pointing down? Is it 5.8? Is it 5.2? How much move do you need to see in core to say vector in place? So I, I think we can't look at the year-over-year -year data simply because you're building in all these 0 0.6, 0 0.7 prints that we've seen over the past year. I think it's all about the month-on-month -month prints, and I think the market is right to, to focus on that. Um, in those prints, you know, we've gotten, I would say, some broad-based uh, deceleration in a lot of these categories. I would expect the trim mean and median measures do look better today. It does support, I think, what is the Fed's leaning towards wanting to downshift in, in December. And then as we get into next year, you know, February, March, it's all about can we maintain some deceleration and will you begin to see the labor market uh, come into better balance over the next several months? And we're seeing the market downgrade the expectation for a 75 basis point rate hike in December. It seems like a 50 basis point rate hike is being locked in as well as a lower terminal rate than perhaps they were thinking uh, just a couple of minutes before this report came out. How much does that change your assessment of how far the Fed will have to go if we get an uh, ongoing downshift in the inflation? Inflation reads. If we get another softer than expected print in December, does that cause you to rethink a a recession and b that it's going to be deep? Yeah, I think the big if is do these do these continue because we've seen these these point three prints before. Um, but no doubt, if you continue to see these come off, um, it's certainly supportive for the Fed not having to get too much higher levels. Our terminal rate has been at 4.9 percent. I think that still seems like a reasonable view at the moment. Um, we wrote a piece yesterday. There's a lot of focus on financial conditions, and certainly with equity markets really taking off here, there will be a lot of focus on our financial conditions easing in a way that ChairPal does not want. What I would highlight that is maybe a little bit different than that is the bank lending channel. And we get sure. the senior loan officer survey. It's a really good leading indicator um, when you see tightening of lending standards on com commercial and industrial loans, um, commercial real estate, um, and we've seen a material tightening there. So it's a question of, has the Fed done enough? How much more do they need to do? The bank lending channel tells us you may not need to have a materially higher terminal rate than, than what's being priced. It's a 3% move on S&P 500 futures. It's a 19 basis point, 20 basis point move in some places on the curve in the bond market. Let me ask you this. You said something that is of interest to me. This gives the Fed the space to do what they were going to do anyway, which is back away from 75 basis point hikes. If this Fed had this data going into the last meeting, would that news conference have been any different? I don't think so. I, I mean, you know, I, I think the worry is when you downshift that you ease financial conditions in a way, kind of like what we saw in July, that you, is counterproductive from the Fed's perspective. This is one data point. We had 0.6 the, the previous month. This is 0.3. There are some encouraging elements within this data point, so I, I definitely want to emphasize that. But the Fed needs to see more to, to say – you know, we, we can decelerate then from 50 down to 25 and ultimately pause at some point. It is something that I think helps them along that path. Um, but it's no, it's not uh, conclusive evidence, I think, that they you know, can peak up at, at 5% and, and be fine. For others watching this and listening right now, they won't just have the hope that the Fed backs away from 75 and goes with 50. And this data, if we get the data like this again on December 13th, it would endorse that approach. <coughs> They're hoping that the second piece of the communication from Chairman Powell also gets readdressed. So it's slower, 75, 50, maybe 25. He also said higher. Does this remove the risk or help to remove the risk that the terminal rate 
scope for the terminal rate to go much higher than where we are priced right now is removed. Yeah, I think some of the context around those comments was lost. You know, when Chair Powell is talking about a higher terminal rate, he's usually referencing what the SEP dot plot was showing in September. That terminal rate was 4.6 as a median. Up from 380. Uh, up, up from 380. But I think he was saying higher than what they had projected as of September. The market went with it and went to five and a quarter percent. Higher on, than on, what we'd on, priced on, already. Absolutely. Sure. And so I, I think there's, there's some context there. He was guiding towards something that was higher than where they were in September, not necessarily something that was materially higher than what the market was pricing at the time. A viewer just wants to know your view. As we got the CPI report, we got initial jobless claims, and we see the continuing claims ticked up to 1.49 uh, million. How much are we looking at increase in employment rates that perhaps people have not really priced in fully? Yeah. So on our read, continuing jobless claims are the best real-time indicators of recessions. Um, there's been a lot of difficulty in interpreting that data. Um, at least if you look to the prior weeks, you had seen this uptick take place, but it was only in the seasonally adjusted data. It was not in the NSA data. So I think there's some caution because there's been a lot of difficulty seasonally adjusting the data um, post the pandemic. But if you continue to see that rise, uh, it is something that tells you the, the labor market is beginning to materially loosen. It. And it is the best real-time indicator of recession. Matt, this was awesome. Getting awesome. into the print, coming out of it. Thank I hope you. we can do it again December 13th. Put that in the diary or something. Okay, Matt Lazzetti Look forward at to Deutsche it. Bank. Looking forward to it too. Picking things up, the epicenter of this move in the equity market actually comes from the bond market. Just a massive move lower in Treasury yields, down 19 basis points at the front end. That triggers a move in the other point of tension for many of you worldwide. It's in the FX market, yields lower, dollar weaker. And look at this move in the equity market. I set off the back of the data, exploding higher on the S&P 500. the legs right now. I'd say it's got some oomph to it. Futures, still. Tom, up 2.9% yeah. on the S&P. <clears throat> and NASDAQ 100 futures, as you might yeah. expect with that move in bond yields, Tom. Yeah. On NASDAQ 100 futures, we're up close to 4%, up 3.75% right now. And Dr. Lizetti said, real simple here, month over month matters. Most of us rarely sure. look at that. If you regress month over month from the peak of 2021, you don't get, John, to 0.3% until early 2024. Wall Street is hyper-focused on month over month core to look for signs of deceleration. Yeah. You need to see another one. Yeah, and exactly. One. Exactly. I don't think these traders are waiting for another one. I think that they're moving now. Or is it just one December big short 13th. cover? One big gloom cover. Is the next mm. stop for this. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research coming up. Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark. Looking forward to that. Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College and Peter Chir of Academy on crypto. All in the next hour. I could care less what Bitcoin trades for, how it trades, why it trades, who trades it. If you're stupid enough to buy it, you'll pay the price for it one day. I've also told people that it can trade at $100,000 before it trades to zero. Now, tulip bulbs tra traded for $75,000 or something like that. The only value of a Bitcoin is what the other guy will pay for. Five years ago, Jamie Dimon, this was the IMF and World Bank meetings and the IIF talking about Bitcoin. I think we all know that, and he's been very clear about that uh, within his annual letter at uh, J.P. Morgan. We're going to do Bitcoin now, but Lisa, i got to quickly get on the markets here. Ian Lingen just publishing, looking at a core unrounded basis, 02 seven two percent which is how you get the market enthusiasm we've got well the market enthusiasm just to give you a sense now it's almost 30 basis points that you're seeing the two-year yield decline by to 4.3 percent versus uh almost yeah, 4.6 percent earlier still it's moving. still moving i mean it's just a yeah. dramatic rethink yeah. of how far and how fast the fed has it'll to be go. interesting to see a short squeeze analysis this afternoon at 4 p.m right now uh, we're going to look at the short squeeze in bitcoin going the other way sonali basic joins us here not so much on bitcoin and she'll be with crypto this afternoon Afternoon, a special event uh, for Bloomberg. But Shanali, I really want to focus here on the humbling nature of this crypto move, this crypto debacle for big Wall Street firms. They have to be shaking in their seats today. Where does crypto money intersect with real money is the question at the end of the day. FTX, the hole in their balance sheet, as we've reported, is about $8 billion. That's bigger than the size of the entire market value of Robinhood today. So it is a lot of money that are, is being asked of where is okay, that Okay, but money? in your world, the split for me is Bitcoin chat, Tether chat, as Lisa talks yes. about, in blockchain. Mm -hmm. Is blockchain and transactional digital threatened by this 
Bitcoin price tobacco. Only insofar as the future investment that could go into it. If you think about how many investors were in FTX and other things that went bust this year, Tom, Sequoia had hundreds of millions of dollars tied to FTX. Not just them, billionaires. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones's family office, uh, uh, Alan Howard, SoftBank. Analysts are rushing around trying to figure out what the exposure was after Sequoia has already written their stake down to zero. Well so how much money is left to invest in blockchain after that? What's your sense in terms of discussing what the shoe that's going to drop next comes from? Is your sense that a lot of the losses have not yet been recognized or offset with sales? I know Jim Bianco is about to join and John Farrow soon. And one of the things he told me yesterday was dozens of firms will fail on the back of this because they had their accounts with FTX and they can no longer get that money back. Those are potential miners, other brokerages, people, right? I think that the distinction for the contagion aspect is the individual who has sold a bill of goods with respect to certain crypto stories that are going bust now versus institutional investors who are going to have to sell, who might even have leverage, which triggers some sort of contagion. How much of that story has yet to unfold? A lot of it, because we don't know how many firms will continue to face pressure on the back of this. One by one, we keep finding out who had accounts. But to your point here, where does the contagion come from and where does it get worse? You talked about Tether. We did see them decouple for a little bit today in the last 24 mm -hmm. hours, really. Those are stable coins. Those are tied to the U.S. dollar. Circle, the uh, the head of Circle, put out an entire tweet thread the other day. I have no idea what Circle is. Another stable coin issuer. I and have no idea what stable coin is going. <laughs> Digital assets tied one-to-one -to, -one to U.S. treasuries with custody and Bank of New York Mellon. Well, can I just ask how much this is really the problem of regulators? Because a lot of people were saying with some of the stable coins, that are pegged to the U.S. dollar. Show us your reserves. Show us that you have the assets. Show us that you're real, that you're really an alternate so uh, source of this. And regulators were hands off. How much really lies in those hands? A lot <laughs> is what it comes down to. For stable coins themselves, that is the most direct link to the U.S. financial okay. system as well as other currencies around the but world. Our Bloomberg surveillance conversations of the of the lack of regulation and SEC <laughs> turf battles with CFTC and that is this the moment where the big banks get together and dial 1-800-Gensler and say, would you guys get your act together? They're probably now? just saying, I told you so. Okay, I get the I told you so, <laughs> but what are we going to do about this? Because we mentioned this, Chanel, I'm sure you missed this. Come on, this is all billionaire gaga ooh, ooh, chit-chat. Forget mm -hmm. about that. Am I right that this morning people are being crushed in this Bitcoin debacle? It's not just today. And to your point here, it's not just the bankers that are sitting there saying, get a handle on it. The exchanges themselves, if you're a U.S.-based exchange, you are saying money has moved offshore. Binance is not based in the United States. FTX was not based in the United States either. And so how is the U.S. supposed to get a handle on a system I, I, where so much of it is not even in the country? Lisa, put a cork in my mouth. It would be unfortunate what I would say. You I mean just like think Gaga, it's... Google billionaires? Is that no, the no? That it's offshore. Say? I have no idea what stablecoin is. I have n none of this stuff. I go to. I'm going to full disclosure, folks. I'm going to BIS and Raphael Auer, who's written best on this and saw the whole thing coming. Well, and a lot that's of people did, to. and yet there were a lot of really sophisticated investors that got that caught up for in it. it. Yeah. And that's the reason why people are thinking about well, the contagion aspect and how this plays out in a bigger level and why people said that really that was one of the reasons for the big sell-off uh, yesterday and the day before in risk assets and equities and even didn't really see a bid for treasuries. To real extent. people are losing real money at the end of the day. Thank you. Lean forward at 1 p.m. this afternoon, a very special edition on Bloomberg. We're putting together our resources on crypto Shanali Basak will join as well for important conversations here on where are we right now on the path from 65,000 down to, well, with a big market pop here, 16 up to 17,000 on a Bitcoin. So we're uh, looking at that. SPX up 3%, 3.1%. Dow up 777 points. That'll be interesting to see as that has led the way uh, recently. The market reaction, Lisa, let's go to the bond market where there's <clears> – <throat> a readjustment yeah. price up, yield down. Right. You're seeing people basically price in fewer rate hikes and a lower terminal rate as a result of the softer than expected CPI print. I'm looking at the two-year yield coming in more than the 10-year yield. I find this interesting. Does this start to lead into people feeling the Fed will pull back and allow inflation to well, run that's, higher yeah, that's for longer? Yeah. And ultimately, it almost matters less when you start seeing below, and this is something you've talked a lot about, Tom, you've been great on it, going back to five 
5%, going back to 4% inflation? Where is it okay and livable I didn't get much and not clarity. the forefront? I, I, I'm glad you bring this up. I did not get clarity on this today, Lisa. I did not get clarity on how we move forward at a 5% core, 4% core, 3% core. I'm going to suggest 99.9% .9 of the Fed's going to say 3% core inflation is not acceptable. They're all going to say that because they don't want to give it any other message, but the market might be pricing something different. And so I am watching the longer end. Do people start to move away from this idea that we're going back to that 2% level for a long time because of a lack of conviction mm -hmm. by the Fed to stay high well, uh, for a very long time? And with the gloom out there, are somebody holding 10% cash we heard uh, today, I, I, I am going to get into the healthy nature of a short squeeze where everybody goes, oops, yeah. and it's an oops rally today. Which is the reason why. All of the economists say you got to wait for a couple, and traders are saying, nope, not going to do it. Bunk. And that's the reason why you're seeing things like you fly, certainly yeah. in the equity space. I mean, triple average all cash. You miss these up days. I mean, that's all there is. Miss the down days. To the miss the up days. 3874 on ESPX Dow, 33,315. The VIX with a vengeance. Wow, there's a wow statistic as we continue to move to the market, opening the VIX 23.81 in two big figures. That is a lower inflation big move. Stay with us. Don't forget our crypto event at 1 p.m. This is Bloomberg.